Chapter 17 The months that follow are particularly harsh. Prisoners die in all manner of ways. Many are taken by disease, malnutrition, and exposure to the cold. A few make it to an electrified fence, killing themselves. Others are shot by a tower guard before they can. The gas chambers and crematoria are also working overtime, and Lale and Leon's tattooing stations team with people as tens of thousands are transported to Auschwitz and Birkenau. Lale and Gita see each other on Sundays when possible. On those days they mingle among other bodies, sneaking touches. Occasionally they can steal time together alone in Gita's block. This keeps them committed to staying alive, and in Lale's case, planning a shared future. Gita's carpo is getting fat from the food Lale brings her. On occasion when Lale is prevented from seeing Gita for an extended period, she asks outright, When is your boyfriend coming next? On one Sunday, Gita finally, after repeated requests, tells Lale what is going on with Silka. Silka is the plaything of Schwarzhuber. Oh, God. For how long has it been going on? I don't know exactly. A year, maybe more? He's nothing more than a drunken, sadistic bastard, Lale says, clenching his fists. I can only imagine how he treats her. Don't say that. I don't want to think about it. What does she tell you about their time together? Nothing. We don't ask. I don't know how to help her. He'll kill her himself if she rejects him in any way. I suspect Silk has already worked that out, otherwise she would have been dead long ago. Getting pregnant is the biggest worry. It's all right. No one is going to get pregnant. You have to be, you know, having your monthly cycle for that to happen. Didn't you know that? An embarrassed Lale says, well, yes, I, I knew that. It's just that it's not something we've talked about, I guess I didn't think. Neither you nor that sadistic bastard need to worry about Silka or me having a baby, okay? Don't compare me to him. Tell her I think she's a hero, and I'm proud to say I know her. What do you mean, hero? She's not a hero, Gita says, with some annoyance. She just wants to live. And that makes her a hero. You're a hero too, my darling. That the two of you have chosen to survive is a type of resistance to these Nazi bastards. Choosing to live is an act of defiance, a form of heroism. In that case, what does it make you? I have been given the choice of participating in the destruction of our people and I have chosen to do so in order to survive. I can only hope I am not one day judged as a perpetrator or a collaborator. Gita leans over and kisses him. You are a hero to me. Time has run on, and they are startled when other girls start returning to the block. They are fully clothed, and so Lale's exit is not as embarrassing as it might otherwise have been. Hello. Hi, Dana. Lovely to see you. Girls, ladies, he says as he leaves. The carpo, in her normal position at the entrance to the building, shakes her head at Lale. You need to be out of here when the others return, okay, Tatoviera? Sorry, won't happen again. Lale moves around the compound with half a spring in his step. He is surprised when he hears his name and looks around to see who's calling him. It's Victor. He and the other Polish workers are heading out of the camp. Victor summons him over. Hi, Victor. Yuri. How are you doing? Not as good as you, by the look of it. What's going on? Lale waves his hand. Nothing, nothing. We have supplies for you. I thought we wouldn't be able to hand them over. Have you got room in your bag? Uh, absolutely. Sorry. I should have come and seen you sooner, but I, uh, was busy. 
Lale opens his bag and both Victor and Yuri fill it. There is too much to fit in. Do you want me to bring the rest back tomorrow? Victor asks. N no, I'll take it. Thanks. I'll see you tomorrow with payment. There is one girl besides Silke, among the tens of thousands in Birkenau, whom the SS have let keep her hair long. She is about Gita's age. Lale has never spoken to her, but he has seen her from time to time. She stands out with her flowing blonde mane. Everybody else tries as best they can to hide their cropped heads beneath a scarf, often torn from their shirt. Lale had asked Boretsky one day what the deal was with her. How is she permitted to keep her hair long? On the day she came into the camp, Boretsky answered, Commandant Hurst was at the selections. He saw her, thought her quite beautiful, and said her hair was not to be touched. Lale has often been astounded by the things he sees in both camps. But for Hurst to think only one girl is beautiful out of the hundreds of thousands who have come through truly confounds him. As Lale hurries back to his room with a sausage shoved down his pants, he turns a corner, and there she is, the only beautiful girl in the camp, staring at him. He makes it back to his room in record time. Chapter 18 Spring has chased away the bitterest demons of winter. The warmer weather offers a ray of hope to everyone who has survived the elements along with their captors' cruel whims. Even Boretsky is behaving less callously. I know you can get things to the Viera, he says, his voice lower than usual. I don't know what you mean, says Lale. Things. You can get them. I know you have contacts from the outside. What makes you say that? Look, I like you, okay? I haven't shot you, have I? You've shot plenty of others. But not you. We're like brothers, you and I. Haven't I told you my secrets? Lale chooses not to challenge the Brotherhood claim. You talk, I listen, says Lale. Sometimes you have given me advice and I have listened. I've even tried writing nice things to my girlfriend. I didn't know that. Now you do, says Borutsky his expression earnest. Now listen, there's something I want you to try to get for me. Lale is nervous that someone might overhear this conversation. I told you. It's my girlfriend's birthday soon, and I want you to get me a pair of nylon stockings to send to her. Lale looks at Boretsky in disbelief. Boretsky smiles at him. Just get them for me, and I won't shoot you, he laughs. I'll see what I can do. It might take a few days. Just don't take too long. Anything else I can do for you? Lale asks. No. You've got the day off. You can go and spend time with Gita. Lale cringes. It's bad enough that Boretsky knows Lale spends time with her, but how he hates hearing the bastard say her name. Before doing what Boretsky has suggested... Lale goes looking for Victor. He eventually finds Yuri, who tells him Victor is sick and not at work today. Lale says he is sorry to hear that and walks off. Can I do something for you? Yuri asks. Lale turns back. I don't know. I have a special request. Yuri raises an eyebrow. I might be able to help. Nylon stockings... You know, the things girls wear on their legs. I'm not a kid, Lale. I know what nylons are. Could you get me a pair? Lale reveals two diamonds in his hand. Yuri takes them. Give me two days. I think I can help you. Thanks, Yuri. Send my best to your father. I hope he's feeling better soon. Lale is crossing the compound to the women's camp when he hears the sound of an aircraft. He looks up as a small plane flies low over the compound and begins to circle back, so low that Lale can identify the symbol of the United States Air Force. A prisoner shouts out, 
It's the Americans! The Americans are here! Everyone looks up. A few people start jumping up and down, waving their arms in the air. Lale looks over at the towers surrounding the compound and notices the guards on full alert, training their rifles down into the compound where the men and women are making a commotion. Some of them are simply waving to get the attention of the pilot. Many others are pointing towards the crematoria and screaming, Drop the bombs! Drop the bombs! Lale considers joining in as the plane flies over a second time and circles for a third pass. Several prisoners run towards the crematoria, pointing desperate to get their message across. Drop the bombs! Drop the bombs! On its third pass over Birkenau, the plane gains height and flies off. The prisoners continue to shout. Many drop to their knees, devastated that their cries have been ignored. Lale begins to back up against the nearby building, only just in time. Bullets rain down from the towers onto those in the compound, hitting dozens of people too slow to move to safety. Faced with the trigger-happy guards, Lale decides against organizing to see Gita. Instead, he goes back to his block, where he is greeted by wailing and crying. The women cradle young boys and girls who have suffered bullet wounds. They saw the plane and joined the other prisoners, running around in the compound, says one of the men. What can I do to help? Take the other children inside, they don't need to see this. Sure. Thanks, Lale. I'll send the old women in to help you. I don't know what to do with the bodies, I can't leave them here. The SS will be around to pick up the dead, I'm sure. It sounds so callous, matter of fact. Tears burn behind Lale's eyes. He shuffles on the spot. I'm so sorry. What are they going to do with us? The man says. I don't know what fate lies in store for any of us. To die here? Not if I can help it. But I don't know. Lale sets about gathering the young boys and girls to shepherd them indoors. Some cry. Some are too shocked to cry. Several of the older women join him. They take the surviving children to the far end of the block and start telling them stories. But this time they don't work. The children cannot be comforted. Most of them remain in a silent state of trauma. Lale goes to his room and returns with chocolate, which he and Nadia break up and offer around. Some of the children take it. Others look at it as if it too will harm them. There is nothing more he can do. Nadia takes him by the hand, raising him to his feet. Thank you. You have done all you can. She brushes his cheek with the back of her hand. Leave us now. I'll go and help the men, Lale responds in a faltering voice. He staggers off outside. There, he helps the men gather the small bodies into a pile for the SS to take away. He notices they are already picking up the bodies that lie in the compound. Several mothers refuse to hand over their precious children, and it is heartbreaking to Lale to see small, lifeless forms being wrenched from their mother's arms. Kishkadar, Vishkadash, Shmeraba. May his name be magnified and made holy. Lale recites the Kaddish in a whisper. He doesn't know how or with what words the Romani honor their dead. It feels a reflex to respond to these deaths in a way he has always known. He sits outside for a long time looking skyward, wondering what the Americans had seen and thought. Several of the men join him in silence a silence that is no longer quiet. A wall of grief surrounds them. Lale thinks about the date, the 4th of April, 1944, when he'd seen it on his worksheets that week. April had jarred with him. April. What was it about April? Then he realized, in three weeks' time, he will have been here for two years. Two years? How has he done it? How is he still breathing when so many aren't? 
He thinks back to the vow he made at the beginning. To survive and see those responsible pay. Maybe, just maybe, those in the plane had understood what was going on and rescue was on the way. It would be too late for those who died today, but maybe their deaths would not be entirely in vain. Hold that thought. Use it to get out of bed tomorrow morning, and the next morning, and the next. The twinkling of stars overhead is no longer a comfort. They merely remind him of the chasm between what life can be and what it is now. Of warm summer nights as a boy, when he would sneak outside after everyone had gone to bed, to let the night breeze caress his face and lull him to sleep. Of the evenings he spent with young ladies, walking hand in hand in a park, by a lake, their way lit by thousands of stars above. He used always to feel comforted by the heavenly roof of the night sky. Somewhere my family will be looking at the same stars now, and wondering where I am. I hope they can get more comfort from them than I can. It was in early March 1942 that Lale said goodbye to his parents, brother and sister, in his hometown of Krompachi. He had given up his job and apartment in the city of Bratislava the previous October. He had made this decision after catching up with an old friend, a non-Jew who worked for the government. The friend had warned him that things were changing politically for all Jewish citizens, and that Lale's charm would not save him from what was coming. His friend offered him a job that he said would protect him from persecution. After meeting with his friend's supervisor, he was offered a job as an assistant to the leader of the Slovakian National Party, which he took. Being part of the SNP was not about religion. It was about keeping the country in the hands of Slovakians. Dressed in a party uniform, which too closely resembled a military uniform, Lale spent several weeks traveling around the country, distributing newsletters and speaking at rallies and gatherings. The party tried in particular to impress on the youth the need to stand together, to challenge the government, who were utterly failing to denounce Hitler and offer protection to all Slovaks. Lale knew all Jews in Slovakia had been ordered to wear the yellow Star of David on their clothing when out in public. He had refused, not out of fear, but because he saw himself as a Slovakian, proud, stubborn, and even, he conceded, arrogant about his place in the world. His being Jewish was incidental and had never before interfered with what he did and who he befriended. If it came up in conversation, he acknowledged it and moved on. It was not a defining trait for him. It was a matter discussed more often in the bedroom than in a restaurant or club. In February 1942, he was given advanced warning that the German Foreign Ministry had requested that the Slovakian government begin transporting Jews out of the country as a source of labor. He requested leave to visit his family, which was granted, and was told he could return to his position in the party at any time, that his job there was secure. He never considered himself naive. Like so many living in Europe at the time, he was worried about the rise of Hitler and the horrors that the Führer was inflicting on other small nations, but he couldn't accept that the Nazis would invade Slovakia. They didn't need to. The government was giving them what they wanted, when they wanted it, and posed no threat. Slovakia just wanted to be left alone. At dinners and at gatherings with family and friends, they sometimes discussed the reports of Jewish persecution in other countries, but they did not consider that as a group, Slovakian Jews were particularly at risk. And yet, here he is now. Two years have passed. He lives in a community largely split into two, Jewish and Romani, identified by their race not their nationality, and this is something Lale still cannot understand. Nations threaten other nations. They have the power. They have the military. 
How can a race spread out across multiple countries be considered a threat? For as long as he lives, be it short or long, he knows he will never comprehend this. Chapter 19 Have you lost your faith? Gita asks, as she leans back into Lale's chest at their place behind the administration building. She has chosen this moment to ask the question, as she wants to hear his response, not see it. Why do you ask? he says, stroking the back of her head. Because I think you have, she says. And that saddens me. Then clearly you haven't. I asked first. Yes, I think I have. When? The first night I arrived here. I told you what happened, what I saw. How any merciful God could let that happen, I don't know. And nothing has happened since that night to change my mind, quite the opposite. You have to believe in something. I do. I believe in you and me, and getting out of here, and making a life together where we can. I know. Whenever and wherever we want, she sighs. Oh, Lale, if only. Lale turns her around to face him. I will not be defined by being a Jew, he says. I won't deny it, but I am a man first, a man in love with you. And if I want to keep my faith, if it is still important to me, I have no say in that. Yes, you do. They fall into an uneasy silence. He watches her, her eyes downcast. I have no problem with you keeping your faith, says Lale gently. In fact, I will encourage your faith if it means a lot to you, and keeps you by my side. When we leave here, I will encourage you to practice your faith, and when our babies come along they can follow their mother's faith. Does that satisfy you? Babies. I don't know if I will be able to have children. I think I'm screwed up inside. Once we leave here, and I can fatten you up a little, we will have babies, and they will be beautiful babies. They will take after their mother. Thank you, my love. You make me want to believe in a future. Good. Does that mean you will tell me your surname and where you come from? Not yet. I told you on the day we leave this place. Please don't ask me again. After parting from Gita, Lale seeks out Leon and a few others from Block 7. It's a beautiful summer's day, and he intends to enjoy the sun and his friends while he can. They sit against the wall of one of the blocks. Their conversation is simple. At the sound of the siren, Lale says his goodbyes and makes his way back to his block. As he nears the building, he senses something is wrong. The Romany children stand around, not running to meet him, but stepping aside as he walks by. He greets them, but they don't respond. He understands why immediately when he opens the door to his room. Displayed on his bed are the gems and currency from under his mattress. Two SS officers are waiting. Care to explain this, Tatoviera? Lale can find no words. One of the officers snatches Lale's bag from his hands and empties his tools and ink bottles onto the floor. Then they put the bounty into the bag. With pistols drawn, they face Lale squarely and motion for him to move. The children stand aside as Lale is marched out of the gypsy camp for what he believes will be the last time. Lale stands in front of Halsteck, the contents of his bag spread out over the Oberschaffjöre's desk. Halsteck picks up and examines each precious stone and piece of jewellery one at a time. Where did you get all this? he asks, not looking up. Prisoners gave it to me. Which prisoners? I do not know their names. Halsteck looks up at Lale, sharp. 
You don't know who gave you all this. No, I do not. I meant to believe that. Yes, sir. They bring it to me, but I do not ask them their names. Hausdeck slams his fist on the desk, causing the gems to jangle. This makes me very angry, Tetoviera. You are good at your job. Now I will have to find someone else to do it. He turns to the escorting officers. Take him to Block 11. He'll soon remember the names there. Lale is marched out and placed in a truck. Two SS officers sit either side of him, each ramming a pistol into his ribs. During the four-kilometer drive, Lale silently says goodbye to Gita and the future they were just imagining. Closing his eyes, he mentally says the names of each of his family members. He cannot picture his siblings as clearly as he used to. His mother he can see perfectly. But how do you say goodbye to your mother, the person who gave you breath, who taught you how to live? He cannot say goodbye to her. He gasps as his father's image comes before him, causing one of the officers to push his pistol harder into his ribs. The last time he saw his father, he was crying. He doesn't want this to be how he remembers him, so he searches for another image and comes up with his father working with his beloved horses. He always spoke so warmly to them in contrast to the way he expressed himself to his children. Lale's brother Max, older and wiser. He tells him he hopes he hasn't let him down, that he has tried to act as Max would have in his place. When he thinks of his little sister Goldie, the pain is too much. The truck comes to a sudden halt, throwing Lale against the officer next to him. He is placed in a small room in Block 11. The reputation of Blocks 10 and 11 are well known. They are the punishment blocks. Behind these secluded torture houses stands the Black Wall, the Execution Wall. Lale expects that he will be taken there after being tortured. For two days he sits in the cell the only light coming in through a crack under the door. While he listens to the cries and screams of others, he relives every moment he has spent with Gita. On the third day, he is blinded by sunlight spilling into the room. A large man blocks the doorway and hands him a bowl of liquid. Lale takes it, and as his eyes adjust, he recognizes the man. Jacob. Is that you? Jakob enters the room, the low ceiling forcing him to stoop. Teto Vieira, what are you doing here? Jakob is visibly shocked. Lale struggles to his feet, his hand outstretched. I often wondered what happened to you, he says. As you predicted, they found work for me. So you're a god? Not just a guard, my friend. Jakob's voice is grim. Sit and eat, and I will tell you what I do here, and what will happen to you. Apprehensively, Lale sits and looks at the food Jakob has given him. A thin, dirty broth containing a single piece of potato. Starving a few moments ago, he finds his appetite has now left him. I have never forgotten your kindness, Jakob says. I was sure I would die of starvation the night I arrived here, and there you were to feed me. Well, you need more food than most. I've heard stories of you smuggling food. Are they true? That's why I'm in here. The prisoners working in the Canada smuggle me money and gems, and I use them to buy food and medicine from the villages which I distribute. I guess someone missed out. And told on me. You don't know who. Do you? No, it's not my job to know. My job is to get names from you. Names of prisoners who might be planning to escape or resist. And of course the names of the prisoners who get the money and jewels to you. 
Lale looks away. The enormity of what Jacob is saying begins to register. Like you, Tato Vieira, I do what I have to do. To survive. Lale nods. I am to beat you until you give me names. I am a killer, Lale. Lale shakes his hanging head, mutters every swear word he knows. I have no choice. Mixed emotions race through Lale. Names of dead prisoners flit through his mind. Could he give Jakob those names? No. They'll find out eventually and then I'll be back here again. The thing is, Jakob says, I can't let you give me any names. Lale stares, confused. You were kind to me and I will make the beating look worse than it is. But I will kill you before I let you tell me a name. I want as little innocent blood on my hands as possible, Jakob explains. Oh, Jakob, I never imagined this would be the work they found for you. I'm so sorry. If I must kill one Jew to save ten others, then I will. Lale reaches his hand up to the large man's shoulder. Do what you have to. Speak only in Yiddish, says Jakob, turning away. I don't think the SS here know you, or that you speak German. Okay, Yiddish it is. I'll be here again later. Back in the darkness, Lale ponders his fate. He resolves to speak no names. It is now a matter of who kills him. A bored SS officer whose supper is getting cold, or Jakob carrying out a just killing to save others. A sense of calm comes over him as he resigns himself to death. Will someone tell Gita what happened to him, he wonders? Or will she spend the rest of her life never knowing? Lale falls into a deep, exhausted sleep. Where is he? His father roars, storming into the house. Once again, Lale has not turned up to work. His father is late home for supper because he had to do Lale's work for him. Lale runs and tries to hide behind his mother, pulling her away from the bench where she stands, putting a barrier between himself and his father. She reaches back and grabs hold of whatever part of Lale or his clothing she can, protecting him from what would otherwise be a cuff over the head at the least. His father doesn't force her away or make any further attempt to reach Lale. I'll deal with him, his mother says. After dinner, I'll punish him. Now sit down. Lale's brother and sister roll their eyes. They've seen and heard it all before. Later that evening, Lale promises his mother he will try to be more helpful to his father. But it is so hard to help his father out. Lale fears he will end up like him, old before his time, too tired to pay his wife a simple compliment about her looks or the food she spends all day preparing for him. That is not who Lale wants to be. I'm your favourite, aren't I, Mama? Lale would ask. If the two of them were alone in the house, his mother would hug him tightly. Yes, my darling, you are. If his brother or sister were present, you are all my favourites. Lale never heard his brother or sister ask this question, but they might have in his absence. When he was a young boy, he would often announce to his family that he was going to marry his mother when he grew up. His father would pretend not to hear. His siblings would goad Lale into a fight, pointing out that their mother was already married. After breaking up their fights, his mother would take him aside and explain to him that he would find someone else one day to love and care for. He never wanted to believe her. As he became a young man, he would run home to his mother each day for the hugged greeting, the feel of her comforting body, her soft skin, the kisses she planted on his forehead. What can I do to help you? He would say. You're such a good boy. You will make someone a wonderful husband one day. Tell me what to do to be a good husband. I don't want to be like Papa. He doesn't make you smile. He doesn't help you. 
Your papa works very hard to earn money for us to live. I know, but can't he do both? Earn money and make you smile? You have a lot to learn before you grow up, young man. Then teach me. I want the girl I marry to like me, to be happy with me. Lale's mother sat down, and he took a seat across from her. You must first learn to listen to her. Even if you are tired, never be too tired to listen to what she has to say. Learn what she likes, and more importantly, what she doesn't like. When you can, give her little treats, flowers, chocolates. Women like these things. When was the last time Papa brought you a treat? It doesn't matter. You want to know what girls want, not what I get. When I've got money, I'll bring you flowers and chocolates, I promise. You should save your money for the girl who captures your heart. How will I know who she is? Oh, you'll know. She drew him into her arms and stroked his hair. Her boy. Her young man. Her image dissolves. Tears. The picture blurs. He blinks. And he imagines Gita in his arms, him stroking her hair. You are right, Mama. I do know. Jakob comes for him. He drags him down a corridor to a small windowless room. A single light bulb hangs from the ceiling. Handcuffs dangle from a chain on the back wall. There is a birch rod lying on the floor. Two SS officers talk together, seemingly oblivious to Lale's presence. He shuffles backwards, not raising his eyes above the floor. Without warning, Jakob swings a punch into Lale's face sending him stumbling back against the wall. The officers now pay attention. Lale attempts to stand. Jakob winds his right foot slowly back. Lale anticipates the coming kick. He backs away just as Jakob's foot connects with his ribs, then exaggerates the impact by rolling and heaving and clutching his chest. As he slowly rises, Jakob punches him again in the face. He takes the full force this time though Jakob had telegraphed his intention to hit him. Blood runs freely from his smashed nose. Jakob pulls Lale roughly to his feet and handcuffs him to the dangling chain. Jakob picks up the birch, tears the shirt from Lale's back and lashes him five times. Then he pulls Lale's trousers and underpants down and whips him across the buttocks five more times. Lale's yelps are not feigned. Jakob jerks Lale's head back. Give us the names of the prisoners who steal for you, Jakob says, firm and menacing. The officers look on, standing casually. Lale shakes his head, whimpering. I don't know. Jakob strikes Lale ten more times. Blood runs down his legs. The two officers begin to pay more attention and step closer. Jakob jerks Lale's head back and snarls at him. Talk! He whispers in his ear. Say you don't know and then faint. And then louder, Give us the names! I never ask. I don't know. You have to believe me. Jakob punches Lale in the stomach. He buckles at the knees, rolls his eyes back and pretends to pass out. Jakob turns to the SS officers. He is a weak Jew. If he knew the names, he would have told us by now. He kicks Lale's legs as he dangles from the chains. The officers nod and walk from the room. The door closes and Jakob quickly releases Lale, laying him gently on the floor. With a cloth hidden in his shirt, he wipes the blood from Lale's body and gently pulls up his pants for him. I'm so sorry, Lale. He helps him to his feet, carries him back to his room, and lays him on his stomach. You did good. You'll need to sleep like this for a while. I'll come back later with some water and a clean shirt. Get some rest now. Over the next few days, Jakob visits Lale each day with food and water and the occasional change of shirt. 
He reports to Lale the extent of his injuries and that they are healing. Lale knows he will be marked for life. Perhaps the Tataviera deserves that. How many times did you strike me? Lale asks. I don't know. Yes, you do. It's over, Lale, and you're healing. Leave it alone. Did you break my nose? I'm having trouble breathing through it. Probably, but not too bad. The swelling's gone down and it's hardly out of shape. You're still handsome. You'll still have the girls chasing you. I don't want girls chasing me. Why not? I've found the one I want. The next day, the door opens and Lale looks up to greet Jakob, but instead there are two SS officers. They indicate for Lale to get to his feet and come with them. Lale stays sitting as he tries to compose himself. Can this be the end? Am I for the Black Wall? He silently says his goodbyes to his family, and lastly to Gita. The SS become impatient, step into his room, and point their rifles at him. He follows them outside on trembling legs. Feeling the sun on his face for the first time in more than a week, he staggers along between the two officers. Looking up, preparing to meet his fate, he sees several other prisoners being bundled into a nearby truck. Maybe this isn't the end. His legs give out, and the officers drag him the remaining short distance. They throw him on, and he doesn't look back. He clings to the side of the truck all the way to Birkenau. Chapter 20 Lale is helped from the truck and dragged into Oberschafjucher Haustek's office. The two SS officers hold him by an arm each. We got nothing out of him even after the big Jew had a go, one of them says. Haustek turns to Lale, who raises his head. So, you really didn't know their names, and they didn't shoot you? No, oh, sir. Returned you to me, eh? Now you're my problem again. Yes, sir. Haustek addresses the officers. Take him to block 31. He turns to Lale. We will get some hard work out of you before your number is up. Mark my words. Lale is dragged from the office. He tries to keep pace with the SS officers but halfway across the compound he gives up and sacrifices the skin on the top of his feet to the gravel. The officers open the door to block 31 and toss him inside before taking their leave. Lale lies on the floor exhausted in body and soul. Several inmates approach him cautiously. Two try to help him up, but Lale cries out in pain and they stop. One of the men pulls up Lale's shirt, revealing the large welts across his back and buttocks. More gently this time, they pick him up and place him on a bunk. He soon falls asleep. I know who this is, one of the prisoners says. Who? another asks. It's the Tatoviera. Don't you recognize him? He probably made your number. Yeah, you're right. I wonder who he pissed off. I got extra rations from him when I was in Block 6. He was always handing out food. I don't know about that. I've only been in this block. I pissed someone off the day I arrived. The man chuckled quietly. He can't make it to supper. I'll bring him some of mine. He's going to need it tomorrow. A short while later, Lale is woken by two men, each with a small piece of bread. They offer it to him, and he gratefully accepts. I've got to get out of here. The men laugh. Sure, my friend. You have two options, then. One is quick. The other might take a little longer. And what are they? Well, 
Tomorrow morning you can go outside and throw yourself on the death cart when it comes around. Or you can come and work in the fields with us until you drop or beg them to shoot you. I don't like those options. I'll have to find another way. Good luck, my friend. You better get some rest. You've got a long day ahead of you, especially in your condition. That night, Lale dreams of his departures from home. The first time he'd left home, he was a young man full of promise, in search of a future to make his own. He would find a job he enjoyed and could grow in. He would have rich experiences visiting the romantic cities of Europe that he'd read about in books. Paris, Rome, Vienna. Above all, he wanted to find that one person he would fall in love with, shower with affection, and the things his mother had said were important. Flowers, chocolates, his time and attention. His second departure, full of uncertainty and the unknown, rattled him. What lay ahead? He arrived in Prague after a long, emotionally painful journey away from his family. He reported as instructed to the relevant government department and was told to find accommodation nearby and to report back weekly until his role was decided. On the 16th of April, a month later, he was told to report with his belongings to a local school. There he was housed with a number of young Jewish men from across Slovakia. Lale prided himself on his appearance, and his living situation did not prevent him from looking his best. Each day he washed and cleaned his clothes in the school toilet block. He didn't know where he was headed, but wanted to make damn sure he looked his best when he arrived. After five days of sitting around, bored, frightened, mostly bored, Lale and the others were told to gather up their possessions and were marched to the railway station. They were told nothing of where they were going. A train designed to transport cattle pulled up, and the men were ordered to climb aboard. Some objected, explaining that the filthy wagon insulted their dignity. Lale watched the response, seeing for the first time his fellow countrymen raise their rifles at Jews and strike the ones who continued protesting. He climbed on board along with all the others. When no one else could be pushed into his wagon, Lale watched as the doors were slammed shut and heard them bolted by members of the Slovakian army, men whose job it should have been to protect him. Over and over he hears the sound of the doors being slammed and bolted, slammed and bolted. The next morning, the two kind prisoners help Lale from the block and stand with him to await roll call. How long has it been since I stood like this? Numbers, numbers. Survival is always about your number. Being ticked off your capo's list tells you that you are still alive. Lale's number is last on the list, since he is the newest occupant of Block 31. After a cup of old, weak coffee and a thin slice of stale bread, they are marched off towards their labor. In a field between the two camps of Auschwitz and Birkenau, they are made to carry large rocks from one side to the other. When the rocks have all been moved over, they are told to take them back again. And so the day goes on. Lale thinks of the hundreds of times he has walked the road alongside and seen this activity taking place. No, I only glimpsed it. I couldn't watch what these men were enduring. He quickly works out that the SS shoot the last one to arrive with his rock. Lale needs to use all of his strength. His muscles ache, but his mind stays strong. On one occasion, he is the second last to arrive. When the day ends, those still living gather up the bodies of those slain and carry them back to the camp. Lale is excused from this task, but told he has one day's grace only. Tomorrow, he will have to pull his weight, provided he's still alive. As they trudge back into Birkenau, Lale sees Beretsky standing inside the gates. He falls into step beside Lale. I heard what happened to you. Lale looks at him. 
Boretsky, can you help me with something? By asking for assistance, he admits to the other men that he is different from them. He knows the officer's name and can ask him for help. Marking himself as friendly with the enemy brings acute shame, but he needs this. Maybe. What is it? Boretsky looks uncomfortable. Can you get a message to Gita? Do you really want her to know where you are? Isn't it better that she thinks you're already dead? Just tell her exactly where I am. Block 31. And tell her to tell Silka. You want her friend to know where you are? Yes, it's important. She'll understand. Hmm. I'll do it if I feel like it. Is it true you had a fortune in diamonds under your mattress? Did they mention the rubies, emeralds, the Yankee dollars, the British and South African pounds? Boretsky shakes his head, laughing, slapping Lale painfully on the back as he walks off. Silka! Gita must tell Silka! He calls after him. A backward wave of Boretsky's arm dismisses Lale. Boretsky enters the women's camp as they are lining up for dinner. Silka sees him approach the capo and then point at Gita. The capo beckons Gita with her finger. Silka draws Dana in close as Gita slowly walks over to Boretsky. They cannot hear what he says, but his message causes Gita to cover her face with her hands. She then turns towards her friends and runs back into their arms. He's alive. Lale is alive she says. He said I'm to tell you, Silka, that he is in Block 31. Why me? I don't know, but he said Lale had insisted I tell you. What can she do? Dana asks. Silka looks away, her mind working feverishly. I don't know, says Gita, not in the mood to analyze. I only know that he is alive. Silka, what can you do? How can you help? Donna pleads. I will think about it, says Silka. He's alive. My love is alive, Gita repeats. That night, Silka lies in the arms of Schwarzhuber. She can tell he is not yet asleep. She opens her mouth to say something, but is silenced by him retrieving his arm from underneath her. Are you all right? she asks, tentatively, fearing he will be suspicious of such an intimate question. Yes. There is a softness in his voice she has not heard before, and emboldened, Silka presses on. I have never said no to you for anything, have I? And I've never asked you for anything before, she says tentatively. That's true, he responds. Can I ask for one thing? Lale makes it through the next day. He does his bit, helping to carry one of the murdered men back. He hates himself for having thoughts only of the pain it causes him, with little compassion for the dead man. What is happening to me? Step by step the pain in his shoulders threatens to drag him down. Fight it. Fight it. As they enter the camp, Lale's attention is caught by two people standing just beyond the fence that separates the prisoners from the staff quarters. The diminutive Silke stands beside Lagerführer Schwarzhuber. A guard on Lale's side of the fence is talking to them. Lale stops, slackening his grip on the corpse which causes the prisoner holding the other end of the body to stumble and fall. Lale looks at Silke, who peers back at him before saying something to Schwarzhuber. He nods and points to Lale. Silke and Schwarzhuber walk away as the guard approaches Lale. Come with me. Lale rests the legs he's been carrying on the ground and looks for the first time at the dead man's face. His compassion returns, and he bows his head at this tragic end to yet another life. He gives an apologetic glance to the other man carrying the body and hurries to follow the guard. The other inmates of Block 31 all stare after him. The guard tells Lale, 
I am instructed to take you to your old room in the gypsy camp. I know the way. Suit yourself. The guard leaves him. Lale stops outside the gypsy camp, watching the children run around. Several of them look at him, trying to make sense of his return. The Tetaviera, they have been told, is dead. One of them runs to Lale, throwing his arms around his waist, hugging him tight, welcoming him home. The others join in, and before long adults are coming out of the block to greet him. Where have you been? they ask. Are you injured? He deflects all their questions. Nadia is standing at the back of the group. Lale makes eye contact with her. Pushing his way through the men, women and children, he stops in front of her. With a finger he wipes a tear from her cheek. It's good to see you, Nadia. We've missed you. I've missed you. All Lale can do is nod. He needs to get away quickly before he breaks down in front of everyone. He rushes to his room, closes the door on the world and lies on his old bed. Chapter 21 Are you sure you're not a cat? Lale hears the words and struggles to register where he is. He opens his eyes to find a grinning Boretsky leaning over him. What? You must be a cat, because you have more lives than anyone else here. Lale struggles to sit up. It was... Silka, yes, I know. Must be nice to have friends in high places. I'd gladly give my life for her not to need such friends. You nearly did give your life. Not that it would have helped her. Yeah, that's one situation I can't do anything about. Boretsky laughs. You really think you run these camps, don't you? Hell, maybe you do. You're still alive and you shouldn't be. How did you get out of Block 11? I have no idea. When they took me out, I was sure I was headed for the Black Wall. But then I was thrown in a truck and brought back here. I have never known anyone to walk away from the Strauss Company. So, well done, Boretsky says. That's one piece of history I don't mind making. How come I've got my old room back? Easy. It comes with the job. What? You're the Tetoviera. And all I can say is thank God the eunuch who replaced you was no match. Haustek is letting me have my job back? I wouldn't go anywhere near him. He didn't want you back, he wanted you shot. It was Schwarzhuber who had other plans for you. I need to get my hands on at least some chocolate for Silke. Tito Vieira, don't. You will be watched very closely. Now come on, I'll take you to work. As they are leaving the room, Lale says... I'm sorry I wasn't able to get you the nylons you wanted. I'd made arrangements but got derailed. Hmm. Well, at least you tried. Anyway, she's not my girlfriend anymore. She dumped me. Sorry to hear that. I hope it wasn't because of something I suggested you say to her. I don't think so. She just met someone who is in the same town. Oh, the same country as her. Lale considers saying something more, but decides to let it drop. Boretsky leads him out of his block and into the compound where a truckload of men has arrived and a selection is taking place. He smiles inwardly at the sight of Leon working, dropping the tattoo stick, spilling ink. Boretsky wanders off and Lale approaches Leon from behind. Need a hand? Leon turns around knocking a bottle of ink over as he grasps Lale by the hand, shaking it vigorously, overjoyed. It's so good to see you, he cries. Believe me, it's good to be back. How are you? Still pissing sitting down. Otherwise I'm okay. So much better now that you're here. Let's get on with it then. Looks like they're sending quite a few our way. 
Does Gita know you're back? Leon asks. I think so. It was her friend Silke who got me out. The one who... Yes. I'll try to see them tomorrow. Give me one of those sticks. I'd better not give them any excuse to throw me back where I was. Leon holds out his tattoo stick as he rummages around in Lale's bag for another one. Together, they begin work, tattooing the newest residents of Birkenau. The next afternoon, Lale waits outside the administration building as the girls leave work. Dana and Gita don't see him until he stands right in front of them, blocking their path. A moment passes before they react. Then both girls throw their arms around him and hug him tightly. Dana cries. No tears come from Gita. Lale releases them and takes each by the hand. Both still beautiful, he tells them. Gita smacks him on the arm with her free hand. I thought you were dead. Again. I thought I'd never see you again. Me too, says Dana. But I'm not. Thanks to you and to Silka, I'm not. I'm here with the two of you where I should be. But, cries Gita. Lale pulls her towards him and holds her securely. Dana kisses him on the cheek. I'll leave you two. It's so good to see you, Lale. I thought Gita would die of a broken heart if you didn't come back soon. Thank you, Dana, says Lale. You're a good friend to both of us. She walks off the smile not leaving her face. Hundreds of prisoners mill around the compound as Lale and Gita stand there, not knowing what to do next. Close your eyes, Lale says. What? Close them and count to ten. But just do it. One eye at a time, Gita does as she's told. She counts to ten, then opens them. I don't understand. I'm still here. I'll never leave you again. Come on. We have to keep moving, she tells him. They walk towards the women's camp. With no bribe for the kapo, Lale can't risk Gita being laid back. They lean gently in towards each other. I don't know how much longer I can stand this. It can't last forever, my darling. Just hang in there. Please hang in there. We'll have the rest of our lives together. But... No buts. I promised you we'd leave this place and make a life together. How can we? We can't know what tomorrow will bring. Look at what just happened to you. I'm here with you now, aren't I? Lale. Leave it, Gita. Will you tell me what happened to you? Where you've been? Lale shakes his head. No. I'm back here with you now. What matters is what I've told you many times, that we will leave this place and have a free life together. Trust me, Gita. I do. Lale likes the sound of that. One day, you will say those two little words to me under different circumstances. In front of a rabbi, surrounded by our family and friends. Gita giggles and lays her head briefly on his shoulder as they reach the entrance to the women's camp. As Lale walks back to his block, two youths approach and walk alongside him. You're the Tetoviera. Who's asking? Says Lale. We hear you might be able to get us some extra food. Whoever told you that was mistaken. We can pay, one of them says, opening his clenched fist to reveal a small but perfect diamond. Lale grits his teeth. Go on. Take it. If you can get us anything, we would really appreciate it, mister. What block are you in? Nine. How many lives does a cat have? The next morning, Lale hangs around the main gates, bag in hand. Twice, SS approach him. Politische Abteilung, he says on both occasions, and is left alone. But he is more apprehensive than he used to be. Victor and Yuri break from the line of men entering the camp and greet Lale warmly. Do we ask where you've been? Victor asks. 
best not, Lale replies. You're back in business? Not like before. I'm scaling it down, okay? Just a little extra food, if you can. No more nylons. Sure. Welcome back, Victor says with enthusiasm. Lale extends his hand. Victor takes it, and the diamond exchanges hands. Down payment. See you tomorrow? Tomorrow. Yuri looks on. It's good to see you again, he says quietly. You too, Yuri. Have you grown? Yeah? I reckon I have. Say, said Lale, you wouldn't happen to have any chocolate on you. I really need to spend some time with my girl. Yuri takes a block out of his bag, handing it to Lale with a wink. Lale heads straight to the women's camp in Block 29. The carpo is where she always is, soaking up the sun. She watches Lale approach. Satoviera! Good to see you again, she says. Have you lost weight? You're looking good, Lale says with the merest hint of irony. You haven't been around for a while. I'm back now, he hands her the chocolate. I'll get her for you. He watches her walk towards the administration building and speak to a female SS officer outside. Then he enters the block and sits, waiting for Gita to walk through the door. He doesn't have to wait long before she appears. She closes the door and walks toward him. He stands and leans on the bunk post. He fears he will struggle to say the words he needs to. He arranges his face into a mask of self-control. To make love whenever and wherever we want. We may not be free, but I choose now, and I choose here. What do you say? She throws herself into his arms, smothering his face with kisses. As they begin to undress, Lale stops and holds Gita's hands. You asked me if I would tell you where I disappeared to, and I said no, remember? Yes. Well, I still don't want to talk about it, but there is something I can't keep from you. Now, you're not to be frightened, and I am all right, but I did take a little bit of a beating. Show me. Lale slides his shirt off slowly and turns his back to her. She says nothing but runs her fingers ever so softly over the welts on his back. Her lips follow and he knows nothing more needs to be said. Their lovemaking is slow and gentle. He feels tears well up and fights them back. This is the deepest love he's ever felt. Chapter 22 Lale spends long hot summer days with Gita, or with thoughts of her. Their workload hasn't diminished, though. Quite the opposite. Thousands of Hungarian Jews are now arriving in Auschwitz and Birkenau every week. As a result, unrest breaks out in both the men's and women's camps. Lale has worked out why. The higher the number on a person's arm, the less respect they receive from everyone else. Every time another nationality arrives in large numbers, turf wars ensue. Gita has told him about the women's camp. The Slovakian girls, who have been in there the longest, resent the Hungarian girls, who refuse to accept that they aren't entitled to the same small perks that the Slovakians have worked hard to negotiate. She and her friends feel that surviving what they have should count for something. They have, for example, obtained casual clothing from the Canada. No more blue and white striped pajamas for them. And they are not prepared to share. The SS do not take sides when fights break out. All involved are punished with an equal lack of mercy. Denied their meager food rations, they might be flogged, sometimes just the one blow with a rifle butt or swagger stick. But at other times they are beaten savagely while their fellow prisoners are forced to look on. Gita and Dana keep well clear of any fights. Gita has enough issues dealing with petty jealousies over her job in the administration building, her friendship with the seemingly protected Silka, 
and of course visits from her boyfriend, the Tatoviera. Lale is largely immune to the camp disputes. Working with Leon and only a handful of other prisoners alongside the SS, he is removed from the plight of the thousands of starving men who must work and fight and live and die together. Living among the Romani also gives him a sense of security and belonging. He realizes he has settled into a pattern of life that is comfortable relative to the conditions of the majority. He works when he has to, spends whatever time he can steal with Gita, plays with the Romani children, talks to their parents, mostly the younger men, but also the older women. He loves how they care for everyone, not only their biological family. He doesn't connect so well with the older men, who mostly sit around not engaging with the children, the young adults or even the older women. When he looks at them, he often thinks about his own father. Late one night, Lale is woken by yelling SS, barking dogs, screaming women and children. He opens his door and looks out to see the men, women and children in his block being forced from the building. He watches until the last woman clutching an infant is shoved brutally out into the night. He follows them all outside and stands, stunned, as all around him, the other gypsy blocks are also emptied. Thousands of people are being herded onto nearby trucks. The compound is lit up and dozens of SS and their dogs corral the mob, shooting at anyone who doesn't respond immediately to the instruction, Get on the truck! Lale stops a passing officer he recognizes. Where are you taking them? he asks. You want to join them, Tatoviera? the man responds, walking on. Lale sinks into the shadows, scanning the crowd. He sees Nadia and runs to her. Nadia, he pleads. Don't go. She forces a brave smile. I don't have a choice, Lale. I go where my people go. Goodbye, my friend. It's been... An officer pushes her along before she can finish. Lale stands paralyzed, watching until the last person has been loaded onto the trucks. The trucks drive off and slowly he walks back into the eerily silent block. He goes back to bed. Sleep will not come. In the morning, Lale, distraught, joins Leon and they work furiously as new transports arrive. Mengele is scanning the silent rows, making his way slowly towards the tattooist's station. Leon's hands tremble at his approach. Lale tries to give him a reassuring look, but the bastard who has mutilated him is only a few feet away. Mengele stops and watches them work. Occasionally he peers closely at a tattoo, increasing Lale and Leon's agitation. His deathly smirk never leaves his face. He attempts eye contact with Lale, who never raises his eyes above the level of the arm he's working on. Teto Viera? Teto Viera? Mengele says, leaning over the table. Maybe today I will take you. He tilts his head, curiously, seeming to enjoy Lale's discomfort. Then, having had his fun, he ambles away. Something light lands on Lale's head, and he looks up. Ash is belching from the nearby crematorium. He starts to tremble and drops his tattoo stick. Leon tries to steady him. Lale, what is it? What's wrong? Lale's scream is choked by a sob. You bastards. You fucking bastards. Leon grips Lale's arm, trying to get him to control himself as Mengele looks their way and starts to walk back over. Lale is seeing red. He is out of control. Tatya. He tries desperately to rein himself in as Mengele arrives. He feels as though he might vomit. Mengele's breath is in his face. Is everything all right here? Yes, here, doctor, everything's fine, Leon answers shakily. Leon bends down and picks up Lale's stick. 
Just a broken stick. We'll fix it and be right back to work, Leon continues. You don't look well, Tatoviera. Would you like me to take a look at you? Mengele asks. <clears throat> Fine. Just a broken stick. Lale coughs. He keeps his head down, turns away and tries to get back to work. Tetoviera! Mengele barks. Lale turns back towards Mengele, jaw clenched, head still low. Mengele has unholstered his pistol. He holds it limply at his side. I could have shot you for turning away from me. He raises the weapon, pointing it at Lale's forehead. Look at me. I could shoot you right now. What would you say to that? Lale raises his head, but moves his gaze to the doctor's forehead, refusing to look into his eyes. Yes. Herr Doctor. I'm sorry it won't happen again. Herr Doctor. He mutters. Get back to work. You're holding things up. Mengele barks, and again walks off. Lale looks at Leon and points to the ash now falling all around them. They emptied the gypsy camp last night. Leon hands Lale his tattoo stick, before going back to work himself in silence. Lale looks up, searching for the sun to shine down on him. But it is concealed by ash and smoke. That evening he returns to his block, which is now occupied by people that he and Leon marked earlier. He shuts himself away in his room. He doesn't want to make friends. Not tonight. Not ever. He wants only silence in his block. Chapter 23 For weeks... Lale and Gita's time together is spent mostly in silence, as she tries in vain to console him. He has told her what happened, and while she understands his distress, she doesn't share it to the same degree. It isn't her fault she never got to know Lale's other family. She had delighted in hearing his stories of the children and their attempts to play with no toys, kicking balls made out of snow or debris seeing who could jump the highest to touch the timber slats on their building, mostly just playing chase. She tries to get him to talk about his biological family, but Lale has become stubborn and is refusing to say anything more until she shares information about her own life. Gita doesn't know how to break the spell of Lale's grief. They have both withstood, for more than two and a half years, the worst of humanity. But this is the first time she's seen Lale sink to this depth of depression. What about the thousands of our people? She yells at him one day. What about what you have seen at Auschwitz with Mengele? Do you know how many people have been through these two camps, do you? Lale does not reply. I see the cards with the names and ages, babies, grandparents. I see their names and their numbers. I can't even count that high. Lale doesn't need Gita to remind him of the number of people who have passed through the camps. He has marked their skin himself. He looks at her. She is studying the ground. He realizes that while to him they were just numbers, to Gita they were names. Her job means that she knows more about these people than he does. She knows their names and ages, and he realizes that this knowledge will forever haunt her. I'm sorry. You're right, he says. Any death is one too many. I'll try not to be so gloomy. I want you to be yourself with me. But it's been going on for too long, Lale. And one day is a long time for us. Smart and beautiful. I'll never forget them, you know. I couldn't love you if you did. They were your family, I know that. I know it's a strange thing for me to say, but you will honor them by staying alive, surviving this place, and telling the world what happened here. 
Lale leans over to kiss her, his heart weighted by love and sorrow. A massive explosion rings out, shaking the ground beneath them. From their spot behind the administration block, they jump to their feet and run to the front of the building. A second explosion makes them look towards the nearby crematorium, where smoke rises and pandemonium is breaking out. The Sonder Commando workers are running from the building, most of them towards the fence that surrounds the camp. Gunfire erupts from the top of the crematorium. Lale looks up and sees Sonder Commando up there, shooting wildly. The SS fire heavy machine guns in retaliation. Within minutes they have put an end to the shooting. What's happening? Gita says. I don't know, we need to get indoors. Bullets strike the ground around them, as the SS take aim at anyone in their sights. Lale pulls Gita up hard against the building. Another loud explosion. That's crematorium four. Someone's blowing it up. We have to get out of here. Prisoners run from the administration building and are gunned down. I have to get you back to your block. It's the only place you'll be safe. An announcement on the loudspeakers. All prisoners return to your blocks. You will not be fired upon if you go now. Go quickly. I'm frightened. Take me with you, she cries. You'll be safer in your own block tonight. They're bound to do a roll call. My darling, you can't get caught outside your block. She hesitates. Go now. Stay in your block tonight and go to work as normal tomorrow. You must not give them any reason to look for you. You must wake up tomorrow. She takes a deep breath and turns to run. In parting, Lale says, I'll find you tomorrow. I love you. That night, Lale breaks his rule and joins the men, mostly Hungarians, in his block to find out what he can about the afternoon's events. It appears some of the women working in an ammunition factory nearby had been smuggling tiny amounts of gunpowder back to Birkenau, pushed up into their fingernails. They had been getting it to the Sonder Commando, who made crude grenades out of sardine tins. They had also been stockpiling weapons including small arms, knives and axes. The men in Lale's block also tell him of rumours about a general uprising, which they wanted to join but didn't believe was meant to happen on this day. They have heard that the Russians are advancing, and the uprising was planned to coincide with their arrival to assist them in liberating the camp. Lale admonishes himself for not having made friends with his block companions sooner. Not having this knowledge nearly got Gita killed. He questions the men extensively on what they know about the Russians and when they are likely to arrive. The replies are vague, but are enough to provoke slight optimism. It has been months since the American plane flew overhead. The transports have kept coming. Lale has seen no lessening of the dedication of the Nazi machine to the extermination of Jews and other groups. Still, these latest arrivals have a more recent connection with the outside world. Perhaps liberation is coming. He is determined to tell Gita what he has learned and ask her to be vigilant in the office, to glean any information she can. At last, a glimmer of hope. Chapter 24 Autumn is bitterly cold. Many don't survive. Lale and Gita hold on to their glimmer of hope. Gita lets her blockmates know of the rumours about the Russians and encourages them to believe that they can outlive Auschwitz. As 1945 begins, temperatures plummet further. Gita cannot stop morale ebbing away. Warm coats from the Canada cannot keep out the chill and fear of another year captive in the forgotten world of Auschwitz-Birkenau. The transport's slow. This has a perverse effect on those prisoners who work for the SS, particularly the Sonder Commando. Having less work to do puts them in danger of execution. As for Lale, he has built up some reserves, but his supply of new currency is much diminished. And the locals, including Victor and Yuri, are no longer coming in to work. Construction has halted. Lale has heard promising news 
that two of the crematoria damaged in the explosions by the resistance fighters are not going to be repaired. For the first time in Lale's memory, more people are leaving Birkenau than are entering. Gita and her co-workers take turns processing those being shipped out, supposedly to other concentration camps. Snow is thick on the ground on a late January day, when Lale is told that Leon has gone. He asks Boretsky as they walk together if he knows where to. Boretsky offers no answer, and warns Lale that he too might find himself on a transport out of Birkenau. But Lale can still make his way mostly unobserved, not required to report at roll call each morning and evening. He hopes this will keep him at the camp, but he doesn't have the same confidence that Gita will remain. Boretsky laughs his insidious laugh. The news of Leon's probable death taps into reserves of pain Lale did not know he still had. You see your world reflected in a mirror. But I have another mirror, Lale says. Boretsky stops. He looks at Lale, and Lale holds his stare. I look into mine, says Lale, and I see a world that will bring yours down. Boretsky smiles. And do you think you will live to see that happen? Yes, I do. Boretsky places his hand on his holstered pistol. I could shatter your mirror right now. You won't do that. You have been out in the cold too long, Tetoviera. Go and get warm and come to your senses. Boretsky walks away. Lale watches him leave. He knows that if they were ever to meet on a dark night on equal terms, it would be he who would walk away. Lale would have no qualms about taking this man's life. He would have the last word. One morning in late January, Gita stumbles through the snow towards Lale, running towards his block somewhere he's told her never to come near. There's something happening, she cries. What do you mean? DSS, they're acting strange. They seem to be panicking. Where's Dana? Lale asks with concern. I don't know. Find her. Go to your block and stay there until I come. I want to stay with you. Lale pulls her off him, holding her at arm's length. Hurry, Gita. Find Dana and go to your block. I'll come and find you when I can. I need to find out what's going on. There haven't been any new arrivals for weeks now. This could be the beginning of the end. She turns and moves reluctantly away from Lale. He reaches the administration building and cautiously enters the office, so familiar to him from years of obtaining supplies and instructions. Inside, it's chaos. SS are yelling at frightened workers who cower at their desks as the SS pull books, cards and paperwork from them. An SS worker hurries past Lale, her hands full of papers and entry books. He bumps into her and she spills what she is carrying. I'm sorry, here, let me help you. They both bend down to gather up the papers. Are you all right? He says as gently as possible. I think you may be out of a job, Tetoviera. Why? What's going on? She leans into Lale, whispering now. We are emptying the camp, starting tomorrow. Lale's heart leaps. What can you tell me, please? The Russians, they're nearly here. Lale runs from the building to the women's camp. The door to block 29 is shut. No one stands guard outside. Entering, Lale finds the women huddled together at the back. Even Silke is here. They gather around him, frightened and full of questions. All I can tell you is that the SS appear to be destroying records, Lale says. One of them told me the Russians are nearby. He withholds the news that the camp is going to be emptying out the next day because he doesn't want to cause further alarm by admitting that he doesn't know where to. What do you think the SS are going to do with us? Dana asks. I don't know. Let's hope they will run off and let the Russians liberate the camp. I'll try to find out more. I'll come back and tell you what I've learned. Don't leave the block. There are bound to be some trigger-happy guards out there. 
He takes Dana by both hands. Dana, I don't know what's going to happen. But while I have the chance, I want to tell you how much I will always be grateful to you for being Gita's friend. I know you have kept her going many times when she has wanted to give up. They embrace. Lale kisses her on the forehead and then hands her over to Gita. He turns to Sukha and Ivana and wraps them both in a bear hug. To Silke, he says, You are the bravest person I have ever met. You must not carry any guilt for what has happened here. You are an innocent. Remember that. In between sobs, she replies, I did what I had to do to survive. If I hadn't, someone else would have suffered at the hands of that pig. I owe my life to you, Silka, and I will never forget that. He turns to Gita. Don't say anything, she says. Don't you dare say a word. Gita. No. You don't get to say anything to me other than you'll see me tomorrow. That's all I want to hear from you. Lale looks at these young women and realizes that there is nothing left to say. They were brought to this camp as girls, and now... Not one of them yet having reached the age of twenty-one. They are broken, damaged young women. He knows they will never grow to be the women they were meant to be. Their futures have been derailed, and there will be no getting back on the same track. The visions they once had of themselves as daughters, sisters, wives and mothers, workers, travellers and lovers, will forever be tainted by what they've witnessed and endured. He leaves them to go in search of Beretsky and information about what the next day will bring. The officer is nowhere to be found. Lale trudges back to his block, where he finds the Hungarian men anxious and worried. He tells them what he knows, but it's of little comfort. In the night, SS officers enter every block in the women's camp and paint a bright red slash down the back of each girl's coat. Once again... The women are marked for whatever fate awaits them. Gita, Dana, Silka, and Ivana take comfort in all of them being marked alike. Whatever happens tomorrow will happen to all of them. Together they will live or die. Sometime during the night, Lale finally falls asleep. He is woken by a great commotion. It takes a few moments for the noises to penetrate his groggy brain. Memories of the night the Romani were taken flood back. What is this new horror? The sound of rifle shots jolts him fully awake. Putting on his shoes and wrapping a blanket around his shoulders, he cautiously goes outside. Thousands of women prisoners are being corralled into rows. There is obvious confusion, as if neither guards nor prisoners know quite what is expected. The SS pay Lale no attention as he walks quickly up and down the rows of women who bunch together from the cold and in fear of what's to come. Snow continues to fall. Running is impossible. Lale watches as a dog snaps at the legs of one of the women and brings her to the ground. A friend reaches down to help her to her feet, but the SS officer holding the dog draws his pistol and shoots the fallen woman. Lale hurries on looking down the rows, searching, desperate. Finally he sees her. Gita and her friends are being pushed towards the main gates, clinging to each other, but he can't see Silka among them, or anywhere in the sea of faces. He focuses back on Gita. She has her head down, and Lale can tell by the movement of her shoulders that she is sobbing. At last she is crying, but I can't comfort her. Dana spots him. She pulls Gita towards the outside of their row and points Lale out to her. Gita finally looks up and sees him. Their eyes meet, hers wet, pleading, his full of sorrow. Focused on Gita, Lale doesn't see the SS officer. He is unable to move out of the way of the rifle that swings at him, connecting with his face and sending him to his knees. Gita and Dana both scream and try to force their way back through the column of women to no avail. They are swept up in the tide of moving bodies. Lale struggles to his feet, 
blood streaming down his face from a large gash above his right eye. Frantic now, he plunges into the moving crowd, searching each row of distraught women. As he gets near the gates, he sees her again, within arm's length. A guard steps in front of him and pushes the muzzle of his rifle into Lale's chest. Gita! He screams. Lale's world is spinning. He looks up at the sky, which seems only to be getting darker as the morning breaks. Above the noise of screaming guards and barking dogs, he hears her. Furman! My name is Gita Furman! Sinking to his knees in front of the unmoving guard, he shouts, I love you! Nothing comes back. Lale remains on his knees. The guard moves away. The cries of the women have stopped. The dogs cease barking. The gates of Bekenau are shut. Lale kneels in the snow, which continues to fall heavily. Blood from the wound in his forehead covers his face. He's locked in, alone. He's failed. An officer comes over to him. You'll freeze to death. Come on, go back to your block. He reaches a hand down and pulls Lale to his feet. An act of kindness from the enemy at the eleventh hour. Cannon fire and explosions wake Lale the next morning. He rushes outside with the Hungarians to be greeted by panicked SS and a chaos of prisoners and captors on the move seemingly oblivious to each other. The main gates are wide open. Hundreds of prisoners walk through unchallenged. Dazed, weak from malnourishment, some stumble around and then choose to return to their block to escape the cold. Lale walks out the gates he has been through hundreds of times before on the way to Auschwitz. A train is standing nearby, belching smoke into the sky ready to leave. Guards and dogs begin rounding up men and pushing them towards the train. Lale gets caught up in the scrum and finds himself scrambling on board. The gates of his wagon are slammed closed. He pushes his way to the side and peers out. Hundreds of prisoners still wander around aimlessly. As the train pulls away, he sees SS open fire on those who remain. He stands, staring through the slats of the wagon, through the snow falling heavily, mercilessly, as Birkenau disappears. Chapter 25 Gita and her friends are on the march with thousands of other women from Birkenau and Auschwitz, trudging along a narrow track through ankle-deep snow. As carefully as they can, Gita and Dana search the rows, all too aware that any straggling is dealt with by a bullet. They ask a hundred times, Have you seen Silke? Have you seen Ivana? The answer is always the same. The women try to support each other by linking arms. At seemingly random times they are halted and told to take a rest. Despite the cold, they sit in the snow, anything to give their feet some relief. Many remain there when the order to move on comes, dead or dying, unable to take another step. Day becomes night, and still they march. Their numbers dwindle which only makes it harder to escape the watchful eye of the SS. During the night, Dana drops to her knees. She can go on no longer. Gita stops with her and for a while they are unseen, screened by other women. Dana keeps telling Gita to go on, to leave her. Gita protests. She would rather die here with her friend, in a field somewhere in Poland. Four young girls offer to help carry Dana. Dana will not hear of it. She tells them to take Gita and go. As an SS officer advances on them, the four girls pull Gita to her feet and drag her with them. Gita looks back at the officer who has stopped beside Dana, but moves on without drawing his pistol. No shot rings out. Clearly he thinks she is already dead. The girls continue to drag Gita. They will not let her go as she attempts to break free and get back to Dana. Through the dark the women stumble on. 
the sound of random shots barely even registering now. No longer do they turn around to see who has fallen. As day breaks, they are brought to a halt in a field by a train track. An engine and several cattle wagons stand waiting. They've brought me here. Now they will take me away, thinks Gita. She has learned that the four girls she is now traveling with are Polish and not Jewish. Polish girls taken from their families for reasons they do not know. They come from four different towns and hadn't known each other before Birkenau. Across the field stands a lone house. Behind it a dense wood spreads out. SS bark out orders as the train engine is stoked with coal. The Polish girls turn to Gita. One of them says, We're going to make a run for that house. If we get shot then we will die here, but we're not going any further. Do you want to come with us? Gita stands up. Once the girls are running, they don't look back. The act of loading thousands of exhausted women onto the train takes all the guards' attention. The door to the house is opened before they reach it. Inside they collapse in front of a roaring fire, adrenaline and relief surging through them. Hot drinks are placed in their hands, along with bread. The Polish girls talk frantically to the homeowners who shake their heads in disbelief. Gita says nothing, not wanting her accent to give away the fact she isn't Polish. It's better their saviors think she is one of them, the quiet one. The man of the house says they can't stay with them as the Germans often search the premises. He tells them to take their coats off. He takes them out the back of the house. When he returns, the red slashes are gone and the coats smell of petrol. Outside, they hear repeated shooting and peering through the curtains they watch as all surviving women are finally herded onto the train. Bodies litter the snow beside the tracks. The man gives the girls the address of a relative in a nearby village, as well as a supply of bread and a blanket. They leave the house and enter the woods, where they spend the night on the freezing ground, curled up together in a vain attempt to stay warm. The bare trees provide little in the way of protection, either from being seen or from the elements. It is early evening before they arrive in the next village. The sun has gone down and the weak street lamps cast little light. They are forced to ask a passerby for help finding the address they've been given. The kind woman takes them to the house they seek and stays with them while they knock on the door. Look after them. She says when the door opens, then walks away. A woman stands aside as the girls enter her home. Once the door is closed, they explain who sent them here. Do you know who that was just now? The woman stammers. No, one of the girls answers. She's SS, a senior SS officer. Do you think she knows who we are? She's not stupid. I've heard stories about her being one of the cruelest people in the concentration camps. An elderly woman comes out of the kitchen. Mother, we have some guests. These poor things were in one of the camps. We must give them something warm to eat. The older woman makes a fuss over the girls, taking them into the kitchen, sitting them at the table. Gita can't remember the last time she sat on a chair at a kitchen table. From a stove the older woman ladles hot soup for them, and then peppers them with questions. The owners decide it is not safe for them to stay here. They are afraid the SS officer will report the girl's presence. The older woman excuses herself and leaves the house. A short while later she returns with a neighbor. Her house has both a roof cavity and a cellar. She is willing to let the five of them sleep in the roof. With the heat from the fireplace rising, it will be warmer up there than in the cellar. They won't be able to stay in the house during the day, though, as every house can be searched at any time by the Germans, even though they seem to be retreating. Gita and her four Polish friends sleep in the roof space each night and spend the days hiding in the nearby woods. Word sweeps through the small village, and the local priest has his parishioners bring food to the house owner each day. 
After a few weeks, the remaining Germans are flushed out by the advancing Russian soldiers, several of whom set up house in the property directly opposite where Gita and her friends sleep. One morning, the girls are late leaving for the woods and are stopped by a Russian standing guard outside the building. They show him their tattoos and try to explain where they have been and why they are here now. Compassionate to their plight, he offers to place a guard outside the house. This means they no longer have to spend their days in the woods. Where they live is no longer a secret, and they receive a smile or a wave from the soldiers when they come and go. One day, one of the soldiers asks Gita a direct question, and when she answers, he immediately recognizes that she isn't Polish. She tells him she's from Slovakia. That evening, he knocks on the door and introduces a young man dressed in a Russian uniform, but who is in fact from Slovakia. The two of them talk into the night. The girls have been pushing their luck in staying by the fire later into the evening. A degree of complacency has set in. One evening, they are caught off guard when the front door bursts open and a drunken Russian staggers in. The girls can see their guard lying unconscious outside. Waving a pistol, the intruder singles out one of the girls and attempts to rip her clothes off. At the same time, he drops his trousers. Gita and the others scream. Several Russian soldiers soon burst into the room. Seeing their comrade on top of one of the girls, one of them pulls out his pistol and shoots him in the head. He and his comrades drag the would-be rapist from the house, apologizing profusely. Traumatized, the girls decide they must move on. One of them had a sister living in Krakow. Maybe she is still there. As a further apology for the attack the previous night, a senior Russian soldier arranges a driver and a small truck to take them to Krakow. They find the sister, still living in her small apartment above a grocery store. The flat is crowded with people, friends who have fled the city and are now returning homeless. No one has any money. To get by, they visit a market every day and each steals one item of food. From these pickings they make a nightly meal. One day at the market, Gita's ears prick up at the sound of her native language being spoken by a truck driver unloading produce. She learns from him that several trucks a week travel from Bratislava to Krakow, bringing fresh fruit and vegetables. He accepts her request to travel back with them. She runs and tells the people she has been living with that she's leaving. Saying goodbye to the four friends she escaped with is very difficult. They come with her to the market and wave her off as the truck carrying her and two of her countrymen leaves in the direction of a host of unknowns. She has long accepted that her parents and two young sisters are dead, but she prays that at least one of her brothers has survived. Becoming partisan fighters with the Russians might have kept them safe. In Bratislava, just as in Krakow, Gita joins other survivors of the camps in shared crowded apartments. She registers her name and address with the Red Cross, having been told that all returning prisoners are doing this in the hope they can find missing relatives and friends. One afternoon she looks out of her apartment window to see two young Russian soldiers jumping over the back fence into the property where she lives. She is terrified. But as they come closer, she recognizes her two brothers, Dodo and Latzlo. Running down the stairs, she flings open the door and hugs them with all her strength. They dare not stay, they tell her. Even though the Russians liberated the town from the Germans, the locals are suspicious of anyone wearing a Russian uniform. Not wanting to spoil the brief sweetness of their reunion, Gita keeps what she knows about the rest of the family to herself. They will find out soon enough, and this is not something to be spoken of in a few snatched minutes. Before they separate, Gita tells them how she too has worn a Russian uniform. It was the first clothing she was given on arrival at Auschwitz. She says she looks better in it than they do, and they all laugh. Chapter 26
Lale's train moves across the countryside. He leans against the compartment wall, fiddling with the two pouches tied inside his trousers that contain the gems he's risked bringing with him. The bulk of them he left under his mattress. Whoever searches his room can have them. Later that evening, the train grinds to a halt, and rifle-toting SS order everyone to scramble out, just as they had nearly three years ago in Birkenau. Another concentration camp. One of the men in Lale's wagon jumps down with him. I know this place. I've been here before. Yeah? Lale says. Malthausen in Austria. Not quite as terrible as Birkenau, but nearly. I'm Lale. Joseph, pleased to meet you. Once the men have all disembarked, the SS wave them through, telling them to go and find themselves a place to sleep. Lale follows Joseph into a block. The men here are starving. Skin-covered skeletons yet they still have enough life in them to be territorial. Peace off! There's no room in here! One man per bunk, each claims his space, and looks prepared to fight to defend it. Two more blocks elicit the same response. Finally, they find one with more space and claim their turf. As others come into the block searching for a place to sleep, they call out the accepted greeting, Peace off! We're full here. The next morning, Lale sees men from the blocks near him, lining up. He realizes he is to be strip-searched, and asked for information about who he is and where he has come from. Again. From his gem pouches, he takes the three largest diamonds and puts them in his mouth. He rushes to the back of the block while the rest of the men are still gathering and scatters the remaining gems there. The inspection of the line of naked men begins. He watches the guards yanking open the mouths of those before him, so he rolls the diamonds under his tongue. He has his mouth open before the inspecting party reaches him. After a quick glance, they walk on by. For several weeks, Lale, along with all the other prisoners, sit around doing virtually nothing. Almost all he can do is watch, in particular the SS guarding them and he tries to work out who can be approached and who must be avoided. He starts to talk occasionally to one of them. The guard is impressed that Lale speaks fluent German. He has heard about Auschwitz and Birkenau. He has not been there, but wants to hear about it. Lale paints a picture removed from reality. Nothing can be gained by telling this German the true nature of the treatment of prisoners there. He tells him what he did there, and how he much preferred to work than sit around. A few days later, the guard asks him if he'd like to move to a subcamp of Mauthausen, at Saura Werke in Vienna. Thinking it cannot be any worse than here, and with assurances from the guard that conditions are slightly better, and the commandant is too old to care, Lale accepts the offer. The guard points out that this camp does not take Jews, so he should keep quiet about his religion. The next day, the guard tells Lale, Gather your things. You are out of here. Lale looks around. Gathered. You leave by truck in about an hour. Line up at the gate. Your name is on the list. He laughs. My name? Yes. You need to keep your arm with its number hidden, okay? I get to answer to my name. Yes. Don't forget. Good luck. Before you go, I'd like to give you something. The guard looks perplexed. From his mouth, Lale takes a diamond, wipes it on his shirt and hands it to him. Now you can't say you never got anything from a Jew. Vienna. Who wouldn't want to visit Vienna? It was a dream destination for Lale in his playboy days. The very word sounds romantic, full of style and possibility but he knows it will now fail to live up to this perception. The guards are indifferent to Lale and the others when they arrive. They find a block and are told where and when to get their meals. Lale's thoughts are dominated by Gita and by how he can get to her. 
being shunted from camp to camp to camp. He cannot bear it much longer. For several days he observes his surroundings. He sees the camp commandant doddering about and wonders how he is still breathing. He chats to amenable guards and tries to understand the dynamic among the prisoners. Once he discovers he is probably the only Slovakian prisoner here, he decides to keep to himself. Poles, Russians, and a few Italians sit around all day, talking with their countrymen, leaving Lale largely isolated. One day, two young men sidle up to him. They say you were the Tetoviera at Auschwitz. Who are they? Someone said they thought they knew you there, and that you tattooed the prisoners. Lale grabs the young man's hand and pulls up his sleeve. No number. He turns to the second man. What about you? Were you there? No. But is it true what they say? I was the Tetoviera. But so what? Nothing. Just asking. The boys walk away. Lale goes back to his daydreaming. He doesn't see the approaching SS officers until they yank him to his feet and frog-march him to a nearby building. Lale finds himself standing in front of the aging commandant, who nods to one of the SS officers. The officer pulls up Lale's sleeve, revealing his number. You were in Auschwitz? the commandant asks. Yes, sir. Were you the Tetoviera there? Yes, sir. So, you are a Jew? No, sir. I am a Catholic. The commandant raises a brow. Oh? I didn't know they had Catholics in Auschwitz. They had all religions there, sir, along with criminals and politicals. Are you a criminal? No, sir. And you are not a Jew? No, sir, I'm Catholic. You have answered no twice. I will ask you only once more. Are you a Jew? No, I am not. Here. Let me prove it to you. With that, Lale undoes the string holding up his trousers and they fall to the floor. He hooks his fingers into the back of his underpants and starts to pull them down. Stop! I don't need to see. Okay, you can go. Pulling his trousers back up, trying to control his breathing, which threatens to give him away, Lale hurries from the office. In an outer office, he stops and slumps in a chair. The officer behind a nearby desk looks at him. Are you all right? Yes. I'm good, just a bit dizzy. Do you know what the date is? It's the 22nd, no, wait, the 23rd of April, why? Nothing. Thanks. Goodbye. Outside, Lale looks at the prisoners sitting lazily around the compound and at the guards who look even lazier. Three years. You've taken three years of my life. You will not have one more day. At the back of the blocks, Lale walks along the fence, shaking it, looking for a weak point. It doesn't take him long to find one. The fence comes away at ground level, and he is able to pull it towards him. Not even bothering to see if anyone is watching, he crawls under and walks calmly away. Forrest provides him with cover from any patrolling Germans. As he walks deeper in, he hears the sound of cannons and rifle fire. He doesn't know whether to walk towards it or run the other way. During a brief ceasefire, he hears the running of a stream. To reach it, he must get closer to the shooting. But he's always had a good internal compass, and that direction feels right. If it is the Russians, or even the Americans on the other side of the stream, he will gladly surrender to them. As the daylight fades into evening, he can see the flash of gunfire and cannons in the distance. Still, it is the water he wants to get to, and hopefully a bridge and a route away. When he gets there, 
A river confronts him rather than a stream. He looks across and listens to the cannon fire. It must be the Russians. I'm coming your way. Lowering himself into the water, Lale is shocked at the freezing cold. He swims slowly out into the river, careful not to disturb the water too much with his strokes in case he's seen. Pausing, he raises his head and listens. The gunfire is closer. Shit, he mutters. He stops swimming and lets the current carry him directly under the crossfire. Just another log or dead body to be ignored. When he thinks he has safely cleared the warring armies, he swims frantically to the far bank. He hauls himself out and drags his drenched body into the trees before collapsing in shivers and passing out. Chapter 27 Lale wakes to the feeling of the sun on his face. His clothes have dried out a bit, and he can hear the sound of the river running below him. He crawls on his belly through the trees that have hidden him overnight and reaches the crest of a road. Russian soldiers are walking along it. He watches for a few moments, fearing gunfire. But the soldiers are relaxed. He decides to accelerate his plan to get home. Lale raises his hands and steps out onto the road, startling a group of soldiers. They raise their rifles immediately. I am Slovakian. I have been in a concentration camp for three years. The soldiers exchange glances. Fuck off, one of them says, and they resume their march, one of them shoving Lale as he goes by. He stands for several minutes as many more soldiers walk past, ignoring him. Accepting their indifference, he carries on, receiving only an occasional glance. He decides to walk in the opposite direction to them, reasoning that the Russians are probably heading to engage with the Germans, so getting as far away as possible makes sense. Eventually a jeep pulls up alongside him and stops. An officer in the back eyeballs him. Who the hell are you? I'm Slovakian. I have been a prisoner in Auschwitz for three years. He pulls up his left sleeve to reveal his tattooed number. Never heard of it. Lale swallows. It's unimaginable to him that a place of such horror should not be known. It's in Poland, that's all I can tell you. You speak perfect Russian, the soldier says. Any other languages? Czech, German, French, Hungarian and Polish. The officer eyes him more carefully. And where do you think you are going? Home? Back to Slovakia? No, you're not. I have just a job for you. Get in. Lale wants to run, but he would have no chance. So he climbs into the passenger seat. Turn around, back to headquarters, the officer instructs the driver. The jeep bumps over potholes and ditches, heading back the way it has come. A few kilometers further on they pass through a small village, and then turn up a dirt road towards a large chalet that sits on the top of a hill overlooking a beautiful valley. They enter a large circular driveway where several expensive-looking cars are parked. Two guards stand either side of an imposing main doorway. The jeep skids to a stop. The driver scrambles out and opens the door for the officer in the back. Come with me, the officer says. Lale scurries after him into the foyer of the chalet. He pauses, shocked by the opulence before him. A grand staircase, works of art, paintings and tapestries on every wall and furniture of a quality he has never seen before. Lale has stepped into a world beyond his comprehension. After what he has known, it's almost painful. The officer heads towards a room off the main foyer, indicating that Lale should follow. They enter a large, exquisitely furnished room. A mahogany desk dominates, as does the person sitting behind it. Judging by his uniform and accompanying insignia, 
Lale is in the presence of a very senior Russian official. The man looks up as they enter. Who have we here? He claims he was a prisoner of the Nazis for three years. I suspect he's a Jew, but I don't think that matters. What does matter is that he speaks both Russian and German, the officer says. And I thought he could be useful to us, you know, in talking to the locals. The senior officer leans back, seems to consider this. Put him to work, then. Find someone to guard him and shoot him if he tries to escape. As Lale is escorted from the room, the senior officer adds, And get him cleaned up, and into some better clothes. Yes, sir. I think he will do well for us. Lale follows the officer. I don't know what they want from me, but if it means a bath and clean clothes... They walk across the foyer and head upstairs to the first floor landing. Lale notes that there are two further floors. They enter a bedroom and the Russian goes to the closet and opens it. Women's clothing. Without a word, he leaves and enters the next bedroom. This time, men's clothes. Find something that fits you and looks good. There should be a bathroom through there, he points. Clean yourself up and I'll be back in a short while. He closes the door behind him. Lale looks around the room. There is a large four-poster bed draped in heavy covers and with mountains of pillows of all shapes and sizes. A chest of drawers he thinks might be solid ebony, a small table complete with Tiffany lamp, and a lounge chair covered in exquisite embroidery. How he wishes Gita were here. He stifles the thought. He cannot afford to think of her not yet. Lale runs his hands over the suits and shirts in the closet, both casual and formal, and all the accessories needed to resurrect the Lale of old. He selects a suit and holds it up to the mirror, admiring the look. It will be close to a perfect fit. He throws it onto the bed. A white shirt soon joins it. From a drawer he selects soft underpants, crisp socks, and a smooth brown leather belt. He finds a polished pair of shoes in another cupboard, a match for the suit. He slips his bare feet into them. Perfect. A door leads to the bathroom. Gold fittings glisten against the white tiles that cover the walls and floor. A large stained glass window casts pale yellow and dark green light around the room from the late afternoon sun. He enters the room and stands still for a long time enjoying the anticipation. Then he runs a deep bath and lowers himself into it, luxuriating in it until the water cools. He adds more steaming water in no hurry for his first bath in three years to end. Eventually he climbs out and dries himself with a soft towel that he finds hanging with several others on the rail. He walks back into the bedroom and dresses slowly, savouring the feel of smooth cotton and linen and woolen socks. Nothing scratches, irritates, or hangs baggily off his shrunken frame. Clearly the owner of these clothes was slim. He sits for a while on the bed, waiting for his minder to return. Then he decides to explore the room some more. He pulls back large drapes to reveal French windows that lead out onto a balcony. He opens the doors with a flourish and steps outside. Wow! Where am I? An immaculate garden stretches out before him, lawn disappearing into a forest. He has a perfect view down onto the circular drive, and he watches as several cars pull up and deposit more Russian officials. He hears the door to his room opening, and turns around to see his minder alongside another lower-ranked soldier. He stays on the balcony. The two men join him and look out over the grounds. Very nice, don't you think? Lale's minder says. You've done well for yourselves. Quite a find. His minder laughs. Yes, we have. This headquarters is a bit more comfortable than the one we had at the front. Are you going to tell me where I fit in? This is Friedrich. He's going to be your guard. 
He will shoot you if you try to escape. Lale looks at the man. His arm muscles bulge against his shirt sleeves, and his chest threatens to pop the buttons that hold it in. His thin lips neither smile nor grimace. Lale's nod of greeting isn't returned. He will not only guard you here, but he will take you to the village each day to make our purchases. Do you understand? What am I buying? Well, it's not wine. We have a cellar full of that. Food, the chefs will buy. They know what they want. So that leaves... Entertainment. Lale keeps his face neutral. You will go into the village each morning to find lovely young ladies interested in spending some time here with us in the evening. Understand? I'm to be your pimp. You understand perfectly. How am I to persuade them? Tell them you are all good-looking fellows who will treat them well? We will give you things to entice them. What sort of things? Come with me. The three men walk back downstairs to another sumptuous room, where an officer opens a large vault set into a wall. The minder enters the vault and brings out two metal tins which he places on the desk. In one, there is currency. In the other, jewellery. Lale can see many other similar tins shelved in the vault. Friedrich will bring you here each morning and you will take both money and jewellery for the girls. We need eight to ten each night. Just show them the payment, and if need be, give them a small amount of money in advance. Tell them they will be paid in full when they arrive at the chalet, and when the evening is over, they will be returned to their homes, safe and well. Lale attempts to reach into the jewellery tin, which is promptly slammed shut. Have you struck a rate with them already? he asks. I'll leave that to you to figure out. Just get the best deal you can. Understand? Sure. You'd like prime beef for the price of sausage. Lale knows the right thing to say. The officer laughs. Go with Friedrich. He'll show you around. You can take your meals in the kitchen or in your room. Let the chefs know. Friedrich takes Lale downstairs and introduces him to two of the chefs. He tells them he would prefer to eat in his room. Friedrich tells Lale that he must not go above the first floor, and even there, he is to enter no room but his own. He gets the message loud and clear. A few hours later, Lale is brought a meal of lamb in a thick, creamy sauce. The carrots are cooked al dente and drip with butter. The whole dish is garnished with salt, pepper, and fresh parsley. He had wondered if he might have lost the ability to appreciate rich flavors. He hasn't. What he has lost, however, is the ability to enjoy the food before him. How can he, when Gita is not there to share it with him? When he has no idea whether she has anything to eat at all. When he has no idea, but he suppresses that thought. He is here now and he must do what he has to do before he can find her. He only eats half of what's on his plate. Always save some. That is how he has lived these past years. Along with the food, Lale drinks most of a bottle of wine. It takes some effort to undress himself before he flops onto his bed and enters the sleep of the intoxicated. He is woken the next morning by the clang of a breakfast tray being placed on the table. He can't remember if he locked his room or not. Perhaps the chef has a key anyway. The evening's empty tray and bottle are taken away, all without a word. After breakfast, he takes a quick shower. He is slipping on his shoes when Friedrich walks in. Ready? Lale nods. Let's go. First stop. The study with the vault. Friedrich and another officer look on as Lale selects a quantity of cash, which is counted and noted in a ledger, then a combination of small items of jewellery, and a few loose gems also noted. I'm taking more than I probably need because it's my first time and I have no idea what the going rate is, okay? He says to both men. 
a shrug. Just make sure you return anything you don't give away, the accountant officer says. Putting the money in one pocket and the jewels in another, Lale follows Friedrich to a large garage block by the chalet. Friedrich commandeers a jeep. Lale gets in, and they drive the few kilometers into the village Lale came through yesterday. Was it only yesterday? How can I feel so different already? During the journey, Friedrich tells him they will drive a small truck in to pick up the girls in the evening. It isn't comfortable, but it's the only vehicle they have that can take twelve. As they enter the village, Lale asks, So where should I look for likely girls? I'll drop you at the top of the street. Go into all the shops. Workers or customers, it doesn't matter as long as they are young and preferably pretty. Find their price, show them the payment. If they want something up front, give them cash only. Tell them we will pick them up at six o'clock outside the bakery. Some have been before. How will I know if they're already attached? They'll say no, I'm thinking. They might also throw something at you, so be prepared to duck. As Lale gets out, he says, I'll be waiting and watching. Take your time. And don't do anything stupid. Lale heads to a nearby boutique, hoping no husbands or boyfriends have gone shopping with their partners today. Everyone looks at him when he enters. He says hello in Russian, before remembering he's in Austria and switching to German. Hello, ladies. How are you today? The women look at each other. A few giggle before the shop attendant asks, can I help you? Are you looking for something for your wife? Not exactly. I want to talk to all of you. Are you Russian? A customer asks. No, I'm Slovakian. However, I am here on behalf of the Russian army. Are you staying at the chalet? Asks another customer. Yes. To Lale's relief. One of the shop attendants speaks up. Are you here to see if we want to party tonight? Yes. Yes, I am. Have you been before? I have. Don't look so frightened. We all know what you want. Lale looks around. There are two shop assistants and four customers. Well, he says cautiously. Show us what you've got, a customer says. Lale empties his pockets onto the counter as the girls gather around. How much can we have? Lale looks at the girl who has been to the chalet before. How much were you paid last time? She waves a diamond and pearl ring under his nose. Plus ten marks. Okay. How about I give you five marks now? Another five tonight, and your choice of a piece of jewellery. The girl rummages through and picks out a pearl bracelet. I'll have this one. Lale takes it gently from her hand. Not yet, he says. Be at the bakery at six tonight. Deal? Deal, she says. Lale hands her five marks, which she stuffs down her bra. The remaining girls peruse the jewellery and choose what they want. Lale gives them each five marks. There is no haggling. Thank you, ladies. Before I leave, can you tell me where I might find some like-minded beauties? You could try the cafe a few doors down, or the library, one of them suggests. Be careful of the grandmas in the cafe, one woman says with a giggle. What do you mean, grandmas? Lale asks. You know, old women. Some of them are over thirty. Lale smiles. Look, says the original volunteer, you could stop any woman you meet in the street. We all know what you want. And there are plenty of us who need good food and drink, even if we have to share it with those ugly Russian pigs. There are no men left here to help us. We do what we have to. As do I, Lale tells them. Thank you all very much. I'll look forward to seeing you tonight. Lale leaves the shop, 
and leans against a wall, taking a breather. One shop, half the girls required. He looks to the other side of the street. Friedrich is looking at him. He gives him a thumbs up. Now, where's that cafe? On his walk there, Lale stops three young women, two of whom agree to come to the party. In a cafe he finds three more. He thinks they are in their low to mid-thirties, but still beautiful women anyone would want to be seen with. That evening, Lale and Friedrich pick up the women, who are all waiting at the bakery, as instructed. They are elegantly dressed and made up. The agreed transaction in jewellery and cash takes place with minimal scrutiny from Friedrich. He watches as they enter the chalet. They are holding hands, wearing resolute expressions and occasionally laughing. I'll take what's left over, Friedrich says, standing close to Lale. Lale takes several notes and a couple of pieces of jewellery from his pockets and hands them to Friedrich, who seems satisfied the transactions have been carried out correctly. Friedrich pockets the goods, then sets about patting Lale down, digging his hands deep into his pockets. Hey, careful, says Lale. I don't know you that well. You're not my type. The kitchen must have been told about his return, as his supper arrives shortly after Lale has entered his room. He eats and then walks out onto the balcony. Leaning on the balustrade, he watches the comings and goings of vehicles. Occasionally the sound of the partying below filters up to him, and he is pleased that he hears only laughter and conversation. Back in his room, he begins to undress for bed. Fiddling around in the cuff of his trousers, he finds the small diamond he has placed there. He takes a single sock out of the drawer and stuffs the diamond into it before retiring for the night. He is woken a few hours later by laughter and chatter coming through his balcony doors. He steps outside and watches as the girls clamber aboard the truck for the trip home. Most seem intoxicated, but none look distressed. He goes back to bed. For the next several weeks, Lale and Friedrich make their twice-daily trips into the village. He becomes well-known there. Even women who never come to the chalet know who he is and greet him in passing. The boutique and the café are his two favourite places, and soon girls gather there at the time they know he will arrive. He is often greeted by his regulars with a kiss on the cheek and a request for him to join the partying that night. They seem genuinely upset that he never does. One day in the café, Serena, a waitress there, says loudly, Lale, will you marry me when the war is over? The other girls there giggle, and the older women tot. She's fallen for you, Lale. She doesn't want any of those Russian pigs, no matter how much money they have, one of the customers adds. You are a very beautiful girl, Serena, but I'm afraid my heart belongs to someone else. Who? What is her name? asks Serena indignantly. Her name is Gita, and I am promised to her. I love her. Is she waiting for you? Where is she? I don't know where she is right now, but I'll find her. How do you even know if she's alive? Oh, she's alive. Have you ever just known something? I'm not sure. Then you've never been in love. I'll see you girls later. Six o'clock. Don't be late. A chorus of goodbyes follows him out the door. That night, as Lale adds a large ruby to his war chest, a terrible homesickness overtakes him. He sits on his bed for a long time. His memories of home have been tainted by his memories of the war. Everything and everyone he cared for is now only visible to him through glasses darkened by suffering and loss. When he manages to pull himself together, he empties the sock onto his bed and counts the gems he has managed to smuggle over the weeks. Then he wanders out onto the balcony. The nights are getting warmer, 
and several of the party-goers are out on the lawn, some lounging about, others playing a kind of chase game. A knock on his bedroom door startles him. Since the first night, Lale has locked his door, whether he is in the room or not. Rushing to open the door, Lale sees the gems on his bed and quickly pulls the covers over them. He doesn't spot the latest ruby falling onto the floor. Why was your door locked? Friedrich asks. I do not want to find myself sharing my bed with one of your colleagues, several of whom I have observed have no interest in the girls we bring them. I see. You are a good-looking man. You know they would reward you handsomely if you were so inclined. I'm not. Would you like one of the girls? They've already been paid. No. Thanks. Friedrich's eye is caught by a sparkling from the rug. He bends down and picks up the ruby. Yet what is this? Lale looks at the gem, surprised. Can you explain why you've got this, Lale? It must have got caught in the lining of my pocket. Really? Do you think if I had taken it I would have left it there for you to find? Friedrich considers him. I suppose not. He pockets it. I'll return it to the vault. What did you want to see me about? Lale asks, changing the topic. I'm being transferred tomorrow, so you'll be doing the morning run and pick up on your own from now on. You mean with someone else? asks Lale. No. You've proven you can be trusted. The general's very impressed with you. Just keep doing what you're doing, and when it's time for everyone to leave here, there might even be a little bonus for you. I'm sorry to see you go. I've enjoyed our conversations in the truck. Look after yourself. There's still a war going on out there. They shake hands. Once Lale is alone, securely locked in his room, he gathers up the gems on his bed and puts them back in the sock. From the closet he chooses the nicest-looking suit and puts it aside. He lays a shirt and several pairs of underpants and socks on the table and slots a pair of shoes underneath it. The next morning, Lale showers and dresses in his chosen clothes, including four pairs of underpants and three pairs of socks. He puts the sock containing the gems into his inside jacket pocket. He takes one last look around his room and then makes his way to the vault. Lale helps himself to his normal amount of money and jewels, and is about to leave when the accountant officer stops him. Wait! Take extra today. We have two very senior officers from Moscow arriving this afternoon. Buy them the best. Lale takes the extra money and jewels. I might be a little bit late back this morning. I'm going to the library as well to see if I can borrow a book. We've got a perfectly good library here. Thanks, but there are always officers in there, and, well, I still find them intimidating. You understand? Oh, okay, as you wish. Lale walks into the garage and nods to the attendant who is busy washing a car. Lovely day, Lale. Keys are in the jeep. I hear you're going alone today. Yes, Friedrich's been transferred. Sure, hope it isn't to the front. The attendant laughs. Just be his rotten luck. Oh, I've got permission to be back later than usual today. Want a bit of action for yourself, do you? Something like that. See you later. Okay. Have a good day. Lale hops casually into the jeep and drives away from the chalet without looking back. In the village, he parks at the end of the main street, leaves the keys in the ignition, and walks away. He spots a bicycle leaning outside a shop, which he casually wheels away. Then he hops on and cycles out of town. A few kilometers away, he is stopped by a Russian patrol. A young officer challenges him. Where are you going? I have been a prisoner of the Germans for three years. I am from Slovakia, and I'm going home. 
The Russian grabs hold of the handlebars, forcing Lale to dismount. He turns away from him and receives a firm kick up the bum. The walk will do you good. Now fuck off. Lale walks on. Not worth arguing. Evening arrives and he does not stop walking. He could see the lights of a small town ahead and picks up his pace. The place is crawling with Russian soldiers, and even though they ignore him, he feels he must move on. On the outskirts of town, he comes across a railway station and hurries over to it, thinking he might find a bench to lay his head for a few hours. Walking out onto a platform, he finds a train alongside, but no signs of life. The train fills him with foreboding, but he represses the fear and walks up and down, peering inside. Carriages. Carriages designed for people. A light in the nearby station office catches his attention, and he walks towards it. Inside, a station master rocks on a chair, his head dropping forward as he fights the need to sleep. Lale steps back from the window and fakes a coughing fit before approaching with a confidence he doesn't really feel. The station master, now awake, comes to the window, opening it just enough for a conversation. Can I help you? The train. Where is it headed? Bratislava. Can I travel on it? Can you pay? Lale pulls the sock from his jacket, extracts two diamonds, and hands them to him. As he does so, the sleeve on his left arm rides up, revealing his tattoo. The station master takes the gems. The end carriage. No one will bother you there. It's not leaving until six in the morning, though. Lale glances at the clock inside the station, eight hours away. I can wait. How long is the journey? About an hour and a half. Thank you. Thank you very much. As Lale is heading for the end carriage, he is stopped by a call from the station master, who catches up to him and hands him food and a thermos. It's just a sandwich the wife made, but the coffee's hot and strong. Taking the food and coffee, Lale's shoulders sag, and he can't hold back the tears. He looks up to see the station master also has tears in his eyes as he turns away, heading back to his office. Thank you. He can barely get the words out. Day breaks as they reach the border with Slovakia. An official approaches Lale and asks for his papers. Lale rolls up his sleeve to show his only form of identification. 32407. I'm Slovakian, he says. Welcome home. Chapter 28 Bratislava Lale steps off the train into the city where he has lived and been happy, where his life should have been playing out for the last three years. He wanders through districts he used to know so well. Many are now barely recognizable due to bombing. There is nothing here for him. He has to find a way back to Krompachi, some 250 miles away. It will be a long trip home. It takes him four days of walking, interspersed with occasional rides in horse-drawn carriages, a ride bareback on a horse and one on a tractor-drawn cart. He pays, when he needs to, the only way he can. A diamond here, an emerald there. Eventually he walks down the street he grew up in and stands across from his family home. The palings on the front fence are gone, leaving just the twisted posts. The flowers, once his mother's pride and joy, are strangled by weeds and overgrown grass. Rough timber is nailed over a broken window. An elderly woman comes out of the house opposite and stomps over to him. What do you think you're doing? Away with you! She screams, brandishing a wooden spoon. I'm sorry, it's just... I used to live here. The old lady peers at him, 
recognition dawning. Lale? Is that you? Yes. Oh, Mrs. Molnar, is that you? Y you... you look... Old, I know. Oh, my lord, Lale, is it really you? They embrace. In choking voices they ask each other how they are, without either letting the other answer properly. Finally his neighbor pulls away from him. What are you doing standing out here? Go on in. Go home. Is anyone living there? Your sister, of course. Oh, my. She doesn't know you're alive? My sister. Goldie is alive? Lale runs across the street and knocks loudly on the door. When no one answers immediately, he knocks again. From inside he hears, I'm coming! I'm coming! Goldie opens the door. At the sight of her brother, she faints. Mrs. Molnar follows him inside as he picks his sister up and lays her on the sofa. Mrs. Molnar brings a glass of water. Cradling Goldie's head lovingly in his arms, Lale waits for her to open her eyes. When she comes to, he offers her the water. She sobs, spilling most of it. Mrs. Molnar lets herself quietly out as Lale rocks his sister, letting his own tears flow too. It is quite some time before he can speak and ask the questions he so desperately wants answers to. The news is bleak. His parents were taken away only days after he left. Goldie has no idea where they went, or if they are still alive. Max went off to join the partisans, and was killed fighting the Germans. Max's wife and their two small boys were taken. Again, she does not know where to. The only positive news Goldie has to offer is her own. She fell in love with a Russian, and they are married. Her name is now Sokolov. Her husband is away on business and is due back in a few days. Lale follows her into the kitchen, not wanting to let her out of his sight as she prepares a meal for them. After they have eaten, they talk late into the night. As much as Goldie pushes Lale for information about where he's been for the past three years, he will only say he has been in a work camp in Poland, and that he is now home. The next day he pours his heart out to both his sister and Mrs. Molnar about his love for Gita, and how he believes she's still alive. You have to find her, Goldie says. You must look for her. I don't know where to start looking. Well, where did she come from? Mrs. Molnar asks. I don't know. She wouldn't tell me. Help me to understand this. You have known her three years, and in all that time she told you nothing about her origins? She wouldn't. She was meant to tell me on the day she left the camp, but everything happened too quickly. All I know is her surname. It's Furman. Well, that's something, but not much, his sister chides him. I've heard that people are starting to come home from the camps, says Mrs. Molnar. They are all arriving in Bratislava. Maybe she's there. If I'm to go back to Bratislava, I need transport. Goldie smiles. So what are you doing sitting here, then? In the town. Lale asks everyone he sees with a horse, bike, car, truck, if he can buy it from them. They all refuse. As he's starting to despair, an old man comes towards him in a small cart drawn by a single horse. Lale steps in front of the animal, forcing the man to rein it in. I'd like to buy your horse and cart, he blurts out. How much? Lale pulls several gems from his pocket. They are real, and worth a lot of money. After inspecting the treasure, the old man says, On one condition. What? Anything. You have to take me home first. 
A short while later, Lale pulls up outside his sister's house and proudly shows off his new means of transport. I haven't got anything for him to eat, she exclaims. He points to the long grass. Your front yard needs mowing? That night, with the horse tethered in the front yard, Mrs. Molnar and Goldie set about making meals for Lale to take on his journey. He hates saying goodbye to them both so soon after arriving home, but they won't hear of him staying. Don't come back without Gita, are the last words Goldie says as Lale climbs into the back of the cart and is nearly thrown out by the horse taking off. He looks back at the two women standing outside his family home, each with an arm around the other, smiling, waving. For three days and nights, Lale and his new companion travel down broken roads and through bombed-out towns. They ford streams where bridges have been destroyed. They give lifts to various people along the way. Lale eats sparingly from his rations. He feels profound grief for his scattered family. At the same time, he longs for Gita, and this gives him the sense of purpose he needs to carry on. He must find her. He has promised. When he eventually arrives back in Bratislava, he goes immediately to the train station. Is it true that survivors from the concentration camps have been coming home? he asks. He is told it is, and is given the train schedule. With no idea where Gita might have ended up, not even which country, he decides the only thing to do is meet every train. He thinks about finding somewhere to stay, but a strange man and a horse is not an attractive proposition as a lodger, so he sleeps in his cart, in whatever spot of vacant land he can find, for as long as it takes for the horse to eat the grass, or for them to be moved along. He is often reminded of his friends in the gypsy camp, and the stories they told him about their way of life. It is nearing the end of summer. The rain is frequent, but doesn't deter him. For two weeks, Lale loiters at the train station as each arrival pulls in. He walks up and down the platform, approaching every disembarking woman. Were you in Birkenau? On the few occasions he gets a yes, he asks, did you know Gita Furman? She was in Block 29. No one knows her. One day the station master asks him if he has registered Gita with the Red Cross, who are taking the names of the missing and of those who have returned and are seeking loved ones. With nothing to lose, he heads into the city centre to the address he has been given. Gita is walking down the main street with two friends when she sees a funny-looking cart being drawn by a horse. A young man stands casually in the back. She steps out onto the road. Time stands still as the horse stops of its own volition in front of the young woman. Lale climbs down from the cart. Gita takes a step towards him. He doesn't move. She takes another step. Hello, she says. Lale drops to his knees. Gita turns around to her two friends, who are looking on in astonishment. Is it him? One of them calls out. Yes, says Gita. It is him. Clearly, Lale is not going to move or is incapable of moving. So Gita walks to him. Kneeling down in front of him, she says, In case you didn't hear me when we left Birkenau, I love you. Will you marry me? He says. Yes, I will. Will you make me the happiest man in the world? Yes. Lale sweeps Gita up into his arms and kisses her. One of Gita's friends comes over and leads the horse away. Then with Gita's arms around Lale's waist and her head resting on his shoulder, they walk away, 
merging into the crowded street, one young couple among many in a war-ravaged city. Epilogue Lale changed his name to Sokolov, the Russian surname of his married sister, a name more readily accepted than Eisenberg in Soviet-controlled Slovakia. He and Gita were married in October 1945, and they set up home in Bratislava. Lale started importing fine fabrics, linen, silk, cotton, from throughout Europe and Asia. He sold these on to manufacturers desperate to rebuild and reclothe their country. With the Soviet Union having taken over Czechoslovakia, according to Lale, his was the only business not immediately nationalized by the communist rulers. He was, after all, providing the very materials the government hierarchy wanted for their personal use. The business grew. He took on a partner and profits increased. Once again, Lale began wearing stylish clothing. He and Gita dined at the best restaurants and holidayed at spa complexes around the Soviet Union. They were strong supporters of a movement to establish a Jewish state in Israel. Gita, in particular, worked quietly behind the scenes, obtaining money from wealthy locals and arranging for it to be smuggled out of the country. When the marriage of Lale's business partner ended, his ex-wife reported Lale and Gita's activities to the authorities. On the 20th of April, 1948... Lale was arrested and charged with exporting jewellery and other valuables from Czechoslovakia. The arrest warrant continued. As a result, Czechoslovakia would have suffered untold economic losses, and Sokolov would have obtained, for his unlawful and marauding actions, significant values in money or possessions. While Lale had been exporting jewellery and money, there was nothing financial in it for him. He'd been giving money away. Two days later, his business was nationalized, and he was sentenced to two years in Ilava prison, a place famous for holding political and German prisoners after the war. Lale and Gita had been smart enough to stash some of their wealth. With contacts in the local government and judiciary, Gita was able to bribe officials to help. One day, Lale received a visit in prison from a Catholic priest. After a while, the priest asked the prison officials to leave the room so he could hear Lale's confession, something that was sacrosanct and for his ears only. Alone, he told Lale to start acting as though he were going mad. If he did a good enough job, they would have to get a psychiatrist to see him. Before too long, Lale found himself in front of a psychiatrist, who told him he was going to arrange for him to be given leave to go home for a few days, before he went over the edge and couldn't be brought back. A week later, he was driven to the apartment where he and Gita lived. He was told he would be picked up in two days to complete his sentence. That night, with the help of friends, they slipped out of the back of their apartment building with a suitcase, each of possessions, and a painting that Gita refused to leave behind. The painting is of a gypsy woman. They also took a large amount of money to give to a contact in Vienna, destined for Israel. Then they hid behind the false wall of a truck, taking produce from Bratislava into Austria. At a given time, on a given day, they walked along a platform at Vienna train station looking for a contact they had never met. Lale described it as like something out of a Le Carre novel. They muttered a password to several single gentlemen until finally one gave the appropriate response. Lale slipped a small briefcase of money to the man, and then he disappeared. From Vienna they travelled to Paris, where they rented an apartment and for several months enjoyed the cafes and bars of the city, returning to its pre-war self. Seeing Josephine Baker, the brilliant black American singer and dancer, performing cabaret was a memory Lale would always carry with him. He described her as having legs up to here, indicating his waist. With no work available for non-French citizens, Lale and Gita decided to leave France. They wanted to go as far away from Europe as possible. So they bought fraudulent passports and set sail for Sydney, where they landed on the 29th of July, 1949. 
On the ship over, they befriended a couple who told them about their family in Melbourne, with whom they intended to live. That was enough to persuade Lale and Gita to settle in Melbourne, too. Once again, Lale entered the textile trade. He bought a small warehouse and set about sourcing fabrics locally and abroad to sell on. Gita decided she wanted to be part of the business, too, and enrolled in a dress design course. She subsequently started designing women's clothing, which added another dimension to their business. Their greatest desire was to have a child, but it simply would not happen for them. Eventually they gave up hope. Then, to their great surprise and delight, Gita fell pregnant. Their son Gary was born in 1961, when Gita was 36 and Lale was 44. Their life was full, with a child, friends, a successful business, and holidays on the Gold Coast, all supported by a love that no hardship had been able to break. The painting of the gypsy woman Gita brought with them from Slovakia still hangs in Gary's house. Author's Note I'm in the lounge of the home of an elderly man. I don't know him well yet, but I've quickly come to know his dogs, Tootsie and Bam Bam, one the size of a pony and the other smaller than my cat. Thankfully, I've won them over, and right now they're asleep. I look away for a moment. I have to tell him. You do know I'm not Jewish, an hour has passed since we met. The elderly man in the chair opposite me gives an impatient but not unfriendly snort. He looks away, folds his fingers. His legs are crossed, and the free foot wraps a silent beat. His eyes look towards the window and the open space. Yes, he says finally, turning to me with a smile. That's why I want you. I relax a little. Maybe I am in the right place after all. So, he says, as though he's about to share a joke, tell me what you know about Jews. Seven branch candlesticks come to mind as I scramble for something to say. Do you know any Jews? I come up with one. I work with a girl named Bella. She's Jewish, I think. I expect disdain, but instead receive enthusiasm. Good, he says. I passed another test. Next comes the first instruction. You will have no preconceptions about what I tell you. He pauses, as though searching for words. I don't want any personal baggage brought to my story. I shift uncomfortably. Maybe there is some. He leans forward unsteady. He catches the table with a hand. The table is unsteady and its uneven legs smacks against the floor, causing an echo. The dogs wake up, startled. I swallow. My mother's name was Schwartweger. Her family were German. He relaxes. We all come from somewhere, he says. Yes, but I'm a Kiwi. My mother's family have lived in New Zealand for over a hundred years. Immigrants? Yes. He sits back, relaxed now. How quickly can you write? He asks. I'm thrown off balance. What exactly is he asking here? Well, well, it depends on what I'm writing. I need you to work quickly. I don't have much time. Panic. I had deliberately not brought any recording or writing materials with me to this first meeting. I'd been invited to hear and consider writing his life story. For now, I just wanted to listen. How much time do you have? I ask him. A little while only. I'm confused. Do you have to be somewhere soon? Yes, he says, his gaze again returning to the open window. I need to be with Gita. I never met Gita. It was her death and Lale's need to join her that pushed him to tell his story. 
He wanted it to be recorded so, in his words, it would never happen again. After that first meeting, I visited Lale two or three times a week. The story took three years to untangle. I had to earn his trust, and it took time before he was willing to embark on the deep self-scrutiny that parts of his story required. We had become friends. No, more than friends. Our lives became entwined as he shed the burden of guilt he had carried for over fifty years, the fear that he and Gita might be seen as collaborators of the Nazis. Part of Lale's burden passed to me as I sat with him at his kitchen table. This dear man, with his trembling hands, his quivering voice, his eyes that still moistened, sixty years after experiencing these most horrifying events in human history. He told his story piecemeal, sometimes slowly, sometimes at bullet pace, and without clear connections between the many, many episodes. But it didn't matter. It was spellbinding to sit with him and his two dogs, and listen to what an uninterested ear might have sounded like the ramblings of an old man. Was it the delightful Eastern European accent? The charm of this old rascal? Was it the twisted story I was starting to make sense of? It was all of these and more. As the teller of Lale's story, it became important for me to identify how memory and history, sometimes waltz in step and sometimes strain to part, to present not a lesson in history, of which there are many, but a unique lesson in humanity. Lale's memories were, on the whole, remarkably clear and precise. They matched my research into people, dates and places. Was this a comfort? Getting to know a person for whom such terrible facts had been a lived reality made them all the more horrific. There was no parting of memory and history for this beautiful old man. They waltzed perfectly in step. The Tattooist of Auschwitz is a story of two ordinary people living in an extraordinary time, deprived not only of their freedom, but their dignity, their names, and their identities. And it is Lale's account of what they needed to do to survive. Lale lived his life by the motto, If you wake up in the morning, it's a good day. On the morning of his funeral, I woke knowing it was not a good day for me, but that it would have been for him. He was now with Gita. Additional Information Lale was born... Ludwig Eisenberg, on 28th of October 1916 in Krompachi, Slovakia. He was transported to Auschwitz on the 23rd of April 1942 and tattooed with the number 32407. Gita was born Gisela Firmanova, Firmin, on 11th of March 1925 in Vranov nad Topur, Slovakia. She was transported to Auschwitz on the 13th of April 1942 and tattooed with the number 34902. And she was retattooed by Lale in July when she moved from Auschwitz to Birkenau. Lale's parents, Josef and Serena Eisenberg, were transported to Auschwitz on the 26th of March 1942 while Lale was still in Prague. Research has uncovered that they were killed immediately upon arrival at Auschwitz. Lale never knew this. It was discovered after his death. Lale was imprisoned in the Straf Company, penal unit, from the 16th of June to the 10th of July 1944, where he was tortured by Jakob. No one was expected to survive or be released from that unit. Gita's neighbour, Mrs. Goldstein, survived and made her way home to Vranov nad Topol. 
Silka was charged as a Nazi conspirator and sentenced to fifteen years' hard labor, which she served in Siberia. Afterwards, she returned to Bratislava. She and Gita met only once in the mid-1970s when Gita went to visit her two brothers. In 1961, Stefan Baretsky was tried in Frankfurt and sentenced to life imprisonment for war crimes. On the 21st of June 1988, he committed suicide in the Konitsky Sift Hospital in Bad Nauheim, Germany. Gita died on the 3rd of October, 2003. Lale died on the 31st of October, 2006. Afterword, Gary Sokolov When I was asked to write an afterword for the book, it was a very daunting request. Memories at so many different levels kept flooding my mind and I was unable to get started. Do I talk about food, which was a primary focus for both my parents, but especially my mother who took pride in a fridge filled with chicken schnitzels, cold cuts and myriad cakes and fruit? I remember her devastation when, in year 11, I went on a major diet. On Friday night she served me my traditional three schnitzels, and I'll never forget the look on her face when I placed two of them back in the tray. What's wrong? Is my cooking no good any more? she asked. It was very hard for her to register that I could no longer eat the quantity I used to. To compensate for this, when my friend came over, he said hello to me and went straight to the fridge. This made her very happy. Our home was always inviting and accepting of everyone. Both mum and dad were very supportive of any and all hobbies and activities that I wanted to try, and keen to introduce me to everything, skiing, travel, horse riding, parasailing and more. They felt they were robbed of their own youth and did not want me to miss out on anything. Growing up, it was a very loving family life. The devotion my parents had to each other was total and uncompromising. When many in their circle of friends started getting divorced... I went to my mother and asked her how she and my father had managed to stay together for so many years. Her response was very simple. Nobody is perfect. Your father has always taken care of me since the first day we met in Birkenau. I know he is not perfect, but I also know he will always put me first. The house was always full of love and affection, especially for me, and after fifty years of marriage to see them both cuddling and holding hands and kissing, I believe this has allowed me to be a very outwardly loving and caring husband and father. Both my parents were determined that I should know what they went through. When the TV series The World at War started, I was thirteen, and they made me watch it by myself every week. They were unable to watch it with me, I remember when they were showing live footage of the camps. I looked to see if I could spot my parents. That footage is stuck in my mind even now. My father was comfortable to talk about his adventures in the camp, but only on the Jewish festivals when he and the men would sit around the table and chat about their experiences, all of which were fascinating. Mum, however, said nothing of the details except on one occasion when she told me that in the camp... When she was very sick, her mother had come to her in a vision and told her, You will get better, move to a faraway land, and have a son. I'll try to give you some insight into how those years affected them both. When my father was forced to close his business when I was sixteen, I came home from school just as our car was being towed away and an auction sign going up outside our home. Inside... My mum was packing up all our belongings. She was singing. Well, I thought to myself, they've just lost everything and mum is singing. She sat me down to tell me what was going on and I asked her, how can you just pack and sing? With a big smile on her face, she said that when you spend years not knowing if in five minutes time you will be dead, there is not much you can't deal with. She said, 
As long as we are alive and healthy, everything will work out for the best. Certain things stuck with them. We would be walking along the street and Mum would bend down and pluck a four- or five-leaf clover from the ground, because when she was in the camp, if you found one and gave it to the German soldiers, who believed they were lucky, you received an extra portion of soup and bread. With Dad, it was the lack of emotion and heightened survival instinct that remained with him, to the point where, even when his sister passed away, he did not shed a tear. When I asked him about this, he said that after seeing death on such a grand scale for so many years, and after losing his parents and brother, he found he was unable to weep. That is, until Mum passed away. It was the first time I'd ever seen him cry. Most of all, I remember the warmth at home, always filled with love, smiles, affection, food, and my father's sharp, dry wit. It was an amazing environment to grow up in, and I will always be grateful to my parents for showing me this way of life. The Tattooist of Auschwitz Written by Heather Morris